very much, everybody, for being here tonight. Can I have a roll call, please? Mayor Harris. Here. Um, Vice Mayor Cardoza. Here. Council Member Boomgarden. Here. Council Member Espandola. Here. And Council Member Shaw. Here. All right, if everybody please stand, I will ask Council Member Espandola to please lead us in the salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, item number one is we're, we're here tonight for a budget workshop and proposed fiscal year 1920 operating budget and capital improvement project budget presented by Robin Bertagma, Ben Moody, and Diana Langley. Welcome and thank you. My pleasure. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Tonight, at first, I'm gonna review the general fund operating budget. Next, Ben will review the capital improvement program budgets. Lastly, Diana will review the water and wastewater rate updates. The proposed operating budgets for the water and wastewater utilities do not include any proposed rate increases since City Council has not yet made a decision in this regard. So what you see in the operating budget tonight is a status quo. Before getting into the details, I'd like to recognize the efforts that the City Council Budget Subcommittee put into this budget process. City Council formed an ad hoc budget committee consisting of Mayor Harris and Councilman Shaw. They devoted a great deal of time to this budget process, meeting with each and every department head and hearing the pitch that was made for the budget request, why the request was needed, and the background <coughs> and history uh, related to it. Then they met with the interim city manager, myself, and Spencer Morrison, the city's accounting manager, to deliberate all those requests. It was a great deal of time and effort spent by them, and I think I can speak for them when I say safely that there's a lot more requests that were needed than monies available to fund those requests. So uh, they tried diligently to deliberate those needs, and what you have before you tonight is based upon that. Thank you both very much for the time and effort and the commitment to the process. I sincerely appreciate it. It was time very well spent. Um, I think it was a, a great effort on your part, and it was uh, an interesting process for staff. We learned a lot along the way. With that, um, much appreciation. Thank you. Let's get started. This slide shows you where the city's general fund dollars go. City Council's priorities have always been public safety and infrastructure maintenance. That's where almost three-fourths of the city's general fund budget dollars are spent. The percentages on this slide change only slightly from year to year, which is what you would expect since these are the areas that continue to be the long-term priorities. This shows you graphically the changes in the city's total general fund revenues over time. There are 10 years of actual historical results, the fiscal year 19 projected total, and the fiscal year 20 proposed budget. You can see that proposed budget, budgeted revenues for fiscal year 20 are expected to increase to the highest level ever. This does include a 50,000, excuse me, a $500,000 proposed transfer in from the city's pension stabilization trust fund to make an additional discretionary payment to CalPERS. I'll be discussing this in more detail a bit later. Suffice it to say that actual revenues are 44.6 million. The total is in, inflated by the anticipated transfer in, but is still an all time high for Yuba City. And please stop me as I'm going through if there's any questions. This is a slim, similar slide with 10 years of actual history, the FY19 projected and proposed fiscal year 20 budget. It includes salaries and benefits, the lighter shade color, and the material supplies and services, the darker shade color, along with the total uh, for the general fund. The difference in proposed FY20 revenues of 45.1 million and expenditures of 44.6 million represents the current budget surplus of $420,200. 
Next, we will review what has changed since we adopted the fiscal year 19 budget. And one more addition is that there is 500,000 of additional discretionary payments for CalPERS included in the fiscal year 20 total appropriations as well uh, to be discussed a little bit further. This is a summary of the changes as to what occurred between the fiscal year 19 adopted budget and the fiscal year 20 proposed budget. We had an operating surplus carried over from fiscal year 19 of $301,356. Revenues increased a total of $2,653,100, including that $500,000 that I mentioned previously. Salaries and benefits increased just under $2.4 million, and I'll show you what the details of those changes were in a later slide. Materials, supplies, and services increased by $198,900. And capital acquisitions actually decreased by 45900 from the prior year, resulting in a proposed operating budget surplus of 420200 This shows you the historical net operating surplus or deficit. The city's had a surplus since fiscal year 14 through 18 and is projected to again in fiscal year 19. Vacancy savings is what has kept the city's results of operation in the general fund positive since fiscal year 14. It's significant and worth mentioning that in fiscal year 14, the surplus from salary and benefit savings was 1.2 million. In 15, it grew to 1.6 million. 16 was 1.9 million. 17, 2.4 million. And 18, 2.7 million. I think it's important to tell you that because this year the projected surplus as submitted by all the departments as part of the budget process is only expected to generate about 750000 in savings from salaries and benefits it's because vacant positions are being filled and they're not, uh, we're not seeing as much turnover as what we have historically in more recent years. So um, this is an alignment with the reduced number of vacancies as HR continues to place a large emphasis on hiring and filling positions. Prudent fiscal management dictates though that we be cautious with one-time savings and only allocate it for one-time expenditures. Each year I like to revisit this. The unmet financing needs previously identified and then I have updates to where we're at uh, with these unmet financing needs more currently based upon um, the last several years. These were originally presented to City Council in November of 2015 as identified by City staff and City Council. The construction of the Tierra Buena Area Park facilities are uh, funded in the proposed CIP on the next slide, so we've included them uh, as an update as far as progress made. With our existing resources, we don't have the financial wherewithal to completely address, resolve, and incorporate all of these items into our budget. However, with City Council's leadership, we have made progress, which I will discuss next. I think it is imperative that we revisit these each year as part of the budget process and discuss what steps we've taken to address them. Now, there's a lot of information here. I'll walk through it, and please ask questions if you have any. To address the city's CalPERS unfunded liability, the city established a pension trust fund with an initial contribution of $2 million back in 2016. That came from the previous Economic Stabilization Reserve Fund. We added $330,000 from the fiscal year 17 surplus, added an additional almost $612,000 from the fiscal year 18 surplus, and then we used $500,000 last fall to make an additional discretionary payment to CalPERS in fiscal year 19. We are recommending a similar payment in fiscal year 20. And again, I have more information on that to follow. The city's UAL, our unfunded actuarial liability, has declined $3 million per last year's actual actuarial reports released in August of last year. The total UAL was $70.3 million per CalPERS actuaries as of June 30th, 2017. And there's a delay in their actuarial reports. So they were dated June 30th, 2017, but they're received by the city in August of 18. So that is the latest and greatest information we have available. 
The city has prioritized very limited general fund infrastructure dollars and has included funding of 60,000 for playground replacement. I know that we reallocated uh, $60,000 of CDBG funds to that effort. So I'm expecting one of the proposed changes to the budget as presented will be to disencumber those general fund dollars and re-encumber them as CDBG dollars. 260,000 for Blackburn Tally field lighting replacement. 1.5 million for Harder Parkway Park and Bike Path, 112,000 for improvements to building and grounds, 1.1 million for Fire Station 2 remodel project, 150,000 for Sam Brandon restroom replacement, and 140,000 for Police Department CIP workstation modifications. <coughs> Beat six, startup costs for police services. The annexation process was not completed and the population count is insufficient to trigger the transfer of revenues from Sutter County to the city at the present time. As mentioned, the CIP budget includes a total of 1,538,000 in funding for construction of Harder Parkway Park and Bike Path, partially using grant funds and development impact fees. As it relates to economic development initiatives, the city has provided funding for formation of the Tourism Business Improvement District, and the city's budget includes a 1% TOT set aside for ongoing support of the Yuba Sutter Lodging Association, which is 10% of what the city receives. I do have a question on that item. I know that the, the, the Lodging Association, the tourism folks came and spoke to us and we talked to them about going back and seeing if they got additional funding. Have we heard anything back from that at all before we consider this request? I have not. Neither I have I. Darren may have an update for us. Can we get an update? To my knowledge, they have not received any commitments. Have they sought any? I know. Okay, thank you. Through the mayor, um, Councilman Boomgarden, when we they came before us, we asked them to come back in June. So the follow up to your question: Have are they slated to come back and represent to us at June with an update? Next council, Next council meeting. Thank you. <coughs> Procedural question then through the mayor. We could conceivably hold off on this item until we heard from them as I was under the impression we were going to? Absolutely we can. We can at the present time remove it from the proposed budget and then add it back if council uh, hears their presentation and the five of you uh, decide that you want to add it back in. So how do we proceed with something like that? Do we take this all at the end? Do we do this one by one as you present them? That's a really good question. We've not gone through this level of detail. I would say let's take it as it comes and let us know. So then I can add it to my draft budget staff report as the modifications that were recommended by city council, if that works for the five of you. So do we do that in the form of a motion? Do we do that in the form of an uh, interest? Or do we do that as consensus? Here he comes. <laughs> uh, this is actually a workshop, so you can't give any formal direction, but you can give preliminary guidance. So if there's three of you that would say, hey, this would be something I'd be looking for in a future budget, you can do that this evening. It does not need to be a formal motion, and there shouldn't be a formal motion taken this evening. Thank you. Councilman Gordon, are you done or? Uh, well, I've, I've put it out there. I'm not, well, <clears throat> I'm not in a position to consider this until I've heard back from the tourism and the lodging folks as I was under the impression we were going to. Okay, I just wanted to be clear. I would concur with that. So you have my support to that one. And I, I have uh, bean counters. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's the intent of the workshop anyway, is we're just reviewing everything in, in that regard, and we're going to come back later. Guidance and direction. So, yes. yeah, the same thing applies to everything that we're discussing tonight. Okay. But I would like a wrap-up at yeah. the end um, so that I know what to bring back to you next week. For this topic, time. apparently, for sure. Okay, perfect. And um, as the flagpole comes to mind, we're going to get to and things like that. And so, the CDBG um, funding yes. for Sam Brannon. Yes. 
Do you have a follow-up question on that? So there isn't, <coughs> I cannot recall the amount that we were considering for this particular economic development initiative. I can tell you, because I expected this question to come up, <laughs> it is 127460 60 to 127,000? Yeah, 127,000. I'm sorry. $127,460. Oh, $460. Yeah, and that's 10% of what the city's TOT revenue is. Correct, because that's what we actually now I'm remembering. Okay. So it changes from year to year based upon what we're budgeting if it's approved by council for inclusion. Yeah, I would like to review that at the end as well. Thank you. And one final question on that. When they presented, they were also going to return to us the seed money that we initially started with, I believe, was 53000 Did they pay that to the yet? They did. Okay. And lastly, uh, vehicles. Staff has analyzed the amount of funding available in the vehicle replacement plan for the general fund on a vehicle-by-vehicle -vehicle basis. We've met with the fleet maintenance supervisor and reviewed the city's entire fleet, estimated the remaining useful life of each vehicle and the estimated replacement cost. Based on that information, the best estimate of what we should be setting aside every year is $1,125,000. Instead, for fiscal year 17 through 20, we've only set aside 800000 So even as I'm pointing out that we have a budget surplus next fiscal year, we have more demands for these resources than what we have resources available. And you'll see that because we come up short on some of the vehicle funding uh, that we're trying to budget for inclusion in this budget as well. Moving into our largest revenue changes, uh, I mentioned that the total was 2,653,000. I've included them here in uh, order of magnitude with property taxes being the largest. Finance is projecting a 4.3% increase in property taxes for next fiscal year. This growth estimate is supported by the city's property tax audit firm, HDL Companies, and trends in property values. This generates an additional 664600 in revenues over what was budgeted for fiscal year 19. Some of the increase, about 115000 relates to fiscal year 19 actuals expected over the budget amount as well. The new 2017 SAFER grant is expected to generate $454,700, an increase of $363,100 over the fiscal year 19 grant revenues, which only included reimbursement for five pay periods because of the expiration of the 2014 grant. Hotel, sur hotel motel surcharge revenues are budgeted at a 2% increase over the amount expected to be received in fiscal year 19. The amount in excess of budget for fiscal year 19 is 146400 So you're seeing the compounding effect there of the increase from one budget year to the next of 171300 I have uh, sales tax is expected to generate a net increase of 160900 and I have two additional slides that will show you more information on sales tax in just a minute. The budget for fiscal year 20 includes a projected increase of 2%. That is contrary to what HDL is telling us that they're projecting throughout the state. They have actually told us that they're expecting a 1.5% decline. So we will be watching sales tax very closely every quarter. The difference between a 2% increase and a 1.5% decline for Yuba City is almost half a million dollars. So it makes a really big difference for us. And that said, our sales tax base is also very heavily reliant on auto dealerships. Um, very well with our auto dealerships. They're expecting that to level off and decline as well. So that's an, in, an area of industry that they're warning us to watch carefully. Building permit revenues are projected to increase by 52000 next year. CSAG revenues, which are property tax revenues, are expected to grow by 45100 which is a 4.3% anticipated increase, the same as regular property taxes. Real property transfer tax is expected to grow by 2% or 39900 All other items combined result in a reduction of revenues of 27000 
Cost allocations increased by $1,085,700. This includes the proposed $500,000 transfer from the Pension Stabilization Trust that I'm going to get into more details later. This is a breakdown of all the changes in cost allocation uh, reimbursements. As we showed Council as part of the Budget 101 presentation, Finance prepares an annual update to both the citywide cost allocation plan and the public works cost allocation plan every year. This shows you the changes resulting from the fiscal year 20 cost allocation plan updates. Streets and roads, TDA fund allocations went up 192,200. Wastewater went up 142,800. Water, 130,200. Uh, the public works allocation to CIP projects went down 84,300. Landscape lighting districts up 68.8. Probably say 68,800, so there's no confusion there. Um, traffic safety fund, 50,000. Stop fund, 50,000. Um, RDA 6,500, other 29,500, and then the increase from the Pension Stabilization Trust Fund proposed uh, transfer in 500,000. On the, can you go back please? On the landscaping and lighting districts, that's a district, so those property owners in that district, uh, well they're Will they be charged additional in order to cover those costs? Um, those are pass-throughs for work that's conducted by city staff to those districts, and those costs will be passed on. But typically, there's reserve funds within the districts, and we have typically CPI inflators. So the increases that are passed through through property taxes is very minimal. Okay. And that could be our responsibility here in the future. We could raise the fees to cover those costs, at least to break even. Because, you know, we, you know we're, that's a negative, correct? No. Oh, it's a pot, pot, well, it's a, well, additional revenue. Yeah, it's additional revenue right. to the general fund. Yeah, the negative is due to um, public works cost allocating to CIP projects. There's a shift there where they're working on more water and wastewater projects, so those cost allocations went up versus the CIP <clears throat> projects went down. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. This shows you the city's historical sales tax revenues, 10 years of actual history, projected 19 and proposed 20. I like to remind you that revenues were higher in fiscal year 16 by 824,000 due to the one-time uh, revenues that had to do with the end of the state's triple flip. Without that irregularity, sales tax has steadily grown since the decline in fiscal year 10. The current year projection represents an all-time high for Yuba City. This is the gross amount and doesn't include the net expected offset of $455,200 for the city's payment to Sutter County, which is included in the budget document under the terms of the Master Tax Exchange Agreement. As I mentioned previously, the estimated increase is 2%. Um, this assumes that the city continues to see steady growth in our sales tax and does not um, slip into an economic downturn. As the number one revenue for the city, it generates approximately one-third of our general fund dollars. We watch sales tax very diligently. To the mayor, I just wanted to clarify, the, the majority of our sales tax is auto sales, is that correct, or is it property or is it a mix? What is? It, sales tax is across the board from any taxable sales, which includes mm -hmm. everything except for food items typically, and there's a few other exceptions. So any consumable goods, um, and a lot of our big box real retailers generate a great deal of sales tax as well, but auto dealerships are, are very great at generating sales tax. That's why agencies like to have auto dealerships in their community. Mm -hmm. um, that said, we do well with all of our retailers. Um, we look at all of them. We get a top 100 list every quarter from our sales tax consultant, but we definitely watch the bigger ones very carefully. And which are those? It's all confidential information. We're not allowed to disclose it. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so if you were able to identify, um, so I guess I'm guessing, 
So the auto sales is a, a big number. Mm -hmm. And secondly would be just myself going to Rayleigh's and buying groceries, or is it just the retail or restaurants or what? It groceries are not taxable, but um, food the establishments food. are. Yeah. Um, we have a um, quarterly sales tax newsletter that we send out, so I'll make sure we just got the more recent ones last week. I'll make sure I get that in everybody's box. Okay. There's a good graph on there that shows what share as a percentage of the city sales tax each quarter is coming from each group of industries. And they aggregate industries that has to be like more than five or they can't disclose them, more than five individual mm. businesses. Okay. Because the idea is that it's a retailer's private information as to what their gross sales are. I see. Okay. So that's where the That's why we're not allowed to share, yes. I got it. Okay. Just because of the trend that it's looking as we're generating more and more revenue, um, but it's also concerning because there's more expenses as well, so both sides. So, right. And the conversations of a downturn, downturn seems to be a common conversation that we have because we just don't know sometimes. Right, so. and I just feel like I have to inform you that, yes, I've budgeted a 2% increase, mm -hmm. but if we start to see a decline, I fully expect that I would be coming forward before you and saying, hey, we need to start holding the line. If we have vacant positions, we probably need to leave them vacant longer, that sort of thing, and giving you recommendations for how we can tighten the belt. Okay, thank you. This slide shows you the impact of the current year sales tax trends compared to budgeted. It shows the most recent four quarters that we have.
contribution for retiree health care funding increased by 43300 <coughs> Only department is retiring with normal service retirement until they are Medicare eligible age, and the police portion of PEMCA are included in these expenses. Other salary and benefit increases netted out to an increase of $25,300, and then the $500,000 additional discretionary payment, also referred to as an ADP to CalPERS from our pension stabilization trust, are included here for total salary and benefit increases in cost. Of just under two point four million dollars on a general fund wide basis. Excuse me, Mayor. We're having a little bit of issue with recording the program. Can we take a five minute break? Sure. All right. <laughs> we are back. Almost. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Welcome. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> I'm about halfway through. <laughs> to the mayor. Yep. Um, that was pro uh, projected health care cost increase 1819. We're uh, doing the budget for 1920. I was informed that the health care costs may are predicted to go down. Are we in. Have you have any information that for 1920 that's going to be going down on our health care costs? Um, not yet. According to Natalie, that information will be out shortly after the beginning of the fiscal year. Okay. And we included a 4% growth factor for half the year, which is equal to 2% for the whole year, okay. not knowing. Um, historically, the average increase has been around 7%. The last two years with the reductions for the Blue Shield plan have really been an anomaly. I would love it if it did. Welcome. This is a summary of the personnel reclassifications and changes contained in the fiscal year 20 budget. It includes the old position and the new position if applicable. They are summarized by department and I'll walk you through them. Included is a community coordinator position for the city manager's office. The Deputy City Manager Economic Growth and Public Affairs has been deleted from the proposed budget. A Customer Service Rep 1-2 is added in finance. This is to replace and make it a permanent position for the limited term position that we've had for the past two years, but we've been unable to keep people. We've had significant staff turnover, folks leaving for more permanent positions, and that's the same experience that HR had as well. Finance requests a reclassification of an administrative analyst position to an accountant one after the resignation of our analyst. This generated a small amount of savings since vacancies are budgeted for at mid-step and the former employee was a long-term employee and was at top step. IT has information systems tech one twos that are flexibly staffed, but the two uh, is at a higher level. Um, the ones are ready to advance to the two level, but we had to request additional budget funding in order to accomplish that. And HR is requesting elimination of the HR Technician 1 and instead requesting to hire a permanent HR tech. Um, and lastly, on this slide, HR requested the reclassification of an HR Technician 2 to an administrative and analyst 1. To the mayor. So... Discussions on job descriptions, stuff like that, adding stuff. Do we discuss this right now on, and then, or do this at the end? You can discuss it now. Okay. Um, I'm going to bring this up because I did a little research also. On the um, Deputy City Manager Economic Development one, um, I know that we're putting funds in economic development. We're talking about, thinking about hiring an economic development firm. I did a little research with uh, some other communities, talked to them. Uh, the economic development, uh, yes, they give money to businesses. They can do that with us here in the town, uh, within our community. They can give us the same services. And uh, j just across the river, they were saying they wish that their economic development was as great as ours. So um, I'd like to make some changes. Make uh, make some changes, and somehow we're taking fifty-five thousand out to the economic development to put it back into this department. And our new city manager is going to need somebody that uh, helps him with our community. He's going to come in, we don't want him to come in blind or, or you know, he, he needs some uh, 
he has some uh, confidence that he can ask and know the community. And somehow, um, I don't know, we were going to budget for the, the growth of public affairs manager, but I'd like to put something that don't have to be as much as it was before, but we got 55000 off the bat and decide what the uh, public growth, uh, the growth and affairs, what we're going to do. And... Um, Put some money in there together. We can make another title, or make the growth, uh, or make it make it something, and we could keep that there, and they could help our new city manager. That's just comments made. Because, uh, like I said, I did a little research. Uh, economic development can give our businesses money here, and they really didn't bring go out and search and bring businesses to those communities. The, the business went to them and knocked on the door, which was great. And then, like I said, they got loans and they can be given to us also. So, how do you want to do that? Just make it up, make it make a something, and we can discuss it later. I can make a note of it, and we can go back and visit it later. Okay. Unless there's more discussion that council would like to have. No, just for clarification, your suggestion is to take the fifty-two thousand we were going to use to become a member of the local EDC. Yes. And do what with it? Put it back. It'd be back into this department. We'd, we'd keep the economic development here and then um, add a, some additional. They knew you're talking about a growth and affairs manager. So it could be growth and affairs slash academic development and make it whatever that employee was going to get and make it appropriate. I don't know. I just say, let's just say, let's say budget 105000 I'm just throwing something out there. It's budget 105000 for economic development slash growth and affairs manager. Something like that is what I'm saying, but take the money back and then add in some. So that's this, not the this, total this, fund. It's just fifty-two thousand of the of the position. Well, I think proposing. we I think we have to pay more on that also, not just the fifty-two thousand. We have to pay additional money throughout the year on that on economic development also. It's not just fifty-two thousand for the year for them every year. I think there's additional money involved also. Okay, I'm but I know I did that. a little research on it. And what did your research reveal? Well, it's that they like I said they give money to businesses in the community, which they can do the exact same to us but they didn't necessarily bring businesses to those communities. The people did come to them, and they led them, they led them on their way. They helped lead them, and we have that here. Okay. And you want to, and you want to add you know, two more to our economic development anyway. You want to add two more you know, on our board. Yeah. Yes, we did. So I just wanted to bring that up and see what we can do. All right. I'm just seeing, I'm trying to see if you're suggesting there's um, 52,000 does not cover a full position. Right. But so I was wondering where where your the balance of that money you're talking about where you well have money. we don't know what what we're budgeting for the growth and public affairs do we um, that that is the title the deputy it's the city same manager thing. economic growth and public affairs right the new position is the oh, community it's the coordinator same thing. I mean, excuse me coordinator I'm sorry community coordinator I'm sorry the community so is there been money established for the community coordinator which is less than half of that. So thirty uh, twenty five thousand here? Or? No, less than half of the full thing, I believe. I don't remember the specific number. I think it was ninety one thousand total salary and benefits for the community coordinator. Which is gonna was on my hit list later on this discussion anyway. Okay. Is that that whole position as well? Um, I just haven't got to it. I may as well get to it now. So put that on our list to uh, propose and remove that. Okay. Did you have uh, something, sir? Yeah, through the mayor. Um, and uh, Robin, correct me in this if this is not the time to get in it because right. I can. I remember the numbers off the top of my head uh, from going through this for several days with the mayor. Um, but to address some concerns right up front, looking at the overall benefit to the city, additional funds, as you will find, have been left in the uh, <coughs> administrative office to help with some of those duties in addition to the new community coordinator position possibly um, on top of the potential of you know becoming the only member that's really a part of the economic development that's not a part of the economic development and to address your comment on uh, businesses businesses as far as large businesses don't come to a community because someone knocks on their door they have a matrix that they look at and they seek out cities based upon the metrics of of what meets their demographics. People have asked for a long time, well, why, you know, does the city not have a red lobster? Why do they not have this? Why do they not have that? 
It's because our city hasn't met the demographics. So uh, to get those national chains, we've got to meet the demographics first. But to address your immediate concern, yes, as she gets into the numbers, you will find uh, the subcommittee allocated some additional resources to help. Um, and uh, I'll wait and let you go over the number. I roughly remember what it was. But then also on top of that, there was the uh, community coordinator. So all of that was taken into consideration. And still with that, there was huge significance savings in a budget that is very, very tight. So that was part of that. And I would like to um, let council know that I misspoke. The total cost of the community coordinator with salary and benefits was 81000 not 90000 <coughs> So I was off by 10. Yeah, I thought it was 70 something. But yeah. So what's considered a huge significant savings? Mm -hmm. No, what is considered a huge significant uh, That whole package before was well over 200000 and the savings in the budget, we were looking at potential leave, it uh, was about 150000 120000 It was, it, that's huge. That's six figures in the budget this tight and um, meeting the needs of the community. We'll discuss it a little later. Thank you. Through, through the mayor. Yeah, through the mayor. So um, <clears throat> looking at, I, I believe, page 39 of the proposed budget. I just want to clarify on the amounts here, mm -hmm. just to be clear, on the um, economic development. Am I on the correct one, 4120? You are. That is economic development. <clears throat> okay. So the total salary benefits um, adopted for this year on the position that we're discussing at this moment is 198899 That's correct. And so... This community coordinator position is a new position that uh, just based on the process is being um, recommended. It's a new position. It's being considered by the council, yes. It's, it, it's being, yeah, it, it's a new position that I'm just learning through the process as well. Um, have we had any discussion to determine the differences between um, the position at hand to the new position? Um, what did we base the decision that a community coordinator can meet the needs of what we are searching to to do in this community in the economic development area am i getting that confused i'm not sure <clears throat> So if we're, if we're considering, if the recommendation is to delete this particular position on the economic development, right, based on um, a tight budget, as was stated, um, $198,899 for this position, but a new position is being proposed for a community coordinator for 91000 include 81, thank you. 81000 which includes salary and benefits, and I'm assuming that's a full-time position. Um, so in, in my, my view, economic development is, is critical and important in order to look at, you know, the proposed revenues that we need to generate in this community. So it's unclear to me by eliminating one position and then developing another position, how is that going to help us with the economic development component? I don't think the presumption was for that position to help with economic development. <clears throat> if I recall our discussion, that's why it's a completely different title. Okay. And I, that's why. Right, and that's why we would join EDC for fifty-two thousand. Have the other position, which is unrelated to economic development necessarily. Okay. That's not their primary function. So it's what, not to supplant. Gotcha. Okay. So what what was the proposed vision for the community coordinator? At the time we discussed it, would be. Some, somebody who help with the city manager, but not at necessarily the management level experience. Mm -hmm. There would be, I, I, don't, I want to avoid using slang, but um, someone who had a variety of different tasks that would fall under a certain purview and umbrella, mm -hmm. not the least of which would be support of council at uncertain events, okay. support of the city manager at some lower level events, and assist with other community outreach endeavors, along with some clerical functions. Okay. Is that similar to something what we have right now with the police department? We have 
a, a somewhat similar, sim a, little bit, a little broader, but somewhat similar. Yes, we, we do have that position right now, correct? Okay. Something so I don't know what he calls it, what it's what I'm, it's I'm, called, but there's community <coughs> policing coordinator. I think. Community yeah, policing, yeah, exactly something similar, to similar to that. So but are a there broader. are they similar in salaries? The two positions. I believe so. I I'm, I don't know. I don't know to be honest. Know. So that's why I'm asking. I don't believe, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor. I don't believe so. I believe that. Is a much higher salary. This one's, this one's much higher. No, this was much lower than than what the other was. Um, if I if I may, um, yeah, it would help. Ex expand yeah. just a little bit. Uh, the term that came up when this was discussed was thinking of this would be filled by an like an intern type position, this person that's finishing up their bachelor's degree or between a bachelor's and master's, possibly in political science or something, to give them an understanding of government to fill a gap that would be uh, needed in the administration of the city to assist the city manager. Uh, not so much as being, um, um, for lack of better words, you know, I, uh, a... Um, an assistant to the council. I mean, they would help us with whatever we need, but it's it's to facilitate the duties in the office that doesn't need, you know, a management authority over that. Um, so that's that's what the thinking was behind it, and where you bring in the economic development component of that is very simple. Um, when we started looking at that, what are we getting now that we can't get from the EDC and at a huge savings, and uh, they just don't weigh themselves out to try to do it in-house um, was the thinking behind it. And we could reallocate some of those resources and accomplish meeting the needs of the city through the city manager's office at a much more cost-effective manner. I, I, I mean, I think efficiency um, is com important um, and being able to... Um, budget funds in a in a well thought out manner is, is equally important, and I see what you're you're thinking in in the long term. Um, but I also believe that we are in the process of hiring a city manager, um, and so it would be really, I think, helpful or allow that in new individual maybe to have some. Um, decisions and and how his administration or hers. I mm -hmm. let me say, let me say in a <coughs> gender way, decision. the person's decision um, to allow the the person decide on that. I I just feel like I I don't feel comfortable um, moving around this whole administration piece. I I could see with the finance and HR because our you know our executive team is making those decisions, and so this other particular part. I, I really just would like to allow our city manager to to make that decision. That's so I'm 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 I would rather hold off on that particular part of it and see how things propose after the person is hired because things could change and and um, if you haven't. Um, I will just say that workforce and economic development is a very, very important, one of those priorities. Um, and I, you know, Ben and I were talking about this today. So this is important to me personally because I am learning and recognizing that without a strong um, development uh, and also of economic, um, that also we have a group of commissioners that are part of this as well, because our commission is part of the economic development group of what we have going here. But if we were to go with EDC, which I like EDC as well, how is that going to unfold with our commissioners and how is that going to be the long-term vision? So those are just a few thoughts that I have, but I really would like to see the city manager perhaps have the final decision on this particular change. Good point. And just to reiterate, this is also the business that I just mentioned that I was going to suggest that we pull back on altogether because oh. of the money savings. But you bring up a good point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. And to the also on that, on your professional services, you uh, to cover this position being eliminated, you bumped it up one hundred four thousand dollars in professional services. What did I do? Well, we made the we haven't done it yet, but we made a decision to bump it up. It went from 42 to 146, and for <clears throat> professional services, that would be them doing that for us. So 
We're only looking at a some explanation behind that that I'm not recalling. Okay. Well, we'll recall? discuss this at a later time. Yeah. I move forward. It's right here. The, these are the increases for economic development. Um, I right. was going to get to the material supplies and services changes next. Okay. So maybe if I back up an and explanation. Okay. then we'll get there. But I do have that for you. Right. Thank you. I'm trying to show you everything that's changed from one year to the next. The next slide. Development services requested reclassification of a plans examiner to a building inspector one two. This generated a small amount of savings within the budget. Public works facilities maintenance requested the addition of a building maintenance one, worker one two. We had that many years back and haven't in recent years since the downturn. They requested that position be added back. Two new police officers were added, one for patrol and one, uh, and the other as a homeless liaison officer. A request was made to reclassify a patrol officer to a canine unit officer. Wastewater requested to reclassify a plant maintenance mechanic to a plant maintenance senior mechanic. And lastly, wastewater requested a new limited term operator and training position. You're first. <laughs> I was going to say that too. Go ahead. You. Through the mayor. <laughs> On the, uh, and this is just a question just so I have the knowledge. I know that we're adding a police officer and I, I appreciate the opportunity to submit questions earlier and, and got them addressed. But I still am curious as to we're adding one police officer. Perhaps the chief can tell us what, what this one police officer is going to mean to the community. Not the homeless officer, but the, the additional field officer. So in essence, this is this is a position. It's an overstaffed position because you're going to have the need. Um, it's not just an additional body just out there. You have a need to have this person that kind of understands the the department, goes through the training, and then becomes a resource for you to use where you plug and play. Correct. Okay. The other question I have is uh, on. Excuse me, I'm sorry, this is Terrell. Can we have the people speaking in the audience come to the podium? Otherwise, it's not recorded on the program. Yes, I should have caught that. Thank you, Terrell. <laughs> Don't trip. <laughs> While he's walking up there, I'll clarify that the request was for more. Um, yeah. It wasn't like I... Um, they were saying we just need one more police officer. That was just what we approved. They would probably take 20 more if we let them have them. I know I would if I was you, but that's what we approved. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. That's Gentlemen. correct. So just to, to reiterate, we wanted to have another additional officer on patrol that we're going to actually work patrol on a shift that will help us cover during times of injury as a backup officer. When officers are on vacation, we wouldn't be paying overtime. So there'd be some savings in there on one hand. Appreciate the answer. You're welcome, sir. Um, building maintenance worker, uh, new position, again, in a tight budget and just trying to understand completely when we're adding new people um, and at the, at the uh, risk of sounding uh, like I'm an advocate for outsourcing, is this a candidate for outsourcing? Is there a full-time need for this building maintenance worker one and two? <laughs> yes, sir, <there> is. <laughs> so not, the, the question, if I caught it correctly, was is there <laughs> I caught it. the question is, is there a need? And absolutely there is a need. There's seventeen buildings. Um, we have a supervisor and we have uh, three full time custodians, but there's not the um person to do that maintenance work um, full-time and, and so um, what's happening is a lot of that consulting is going out for um, HVAC um, uh, cleanings and, and different things that we believe could be done in-house to ultimately um, I don't know if it's going to save money but it's going to be more efficient with um, not having to have our supervisor um, 
constantly coordinate with um, the consultants, but actually have somebody to be able to do the repair work in timely. I guess my question um, comes to then you guys have investigated, just humor me with this and, and make me feel better. You guys have taken a look at the cost of you know continuing to outsource versus pay and benefits and everything else for a full-time worker to do essentially the same work. Absolutely. And, and then also we've looked at that at the custodian level also to see what the um, limited term express, um, what we do for special projects where they could come in and we don't need them and there's, uh, there's not enough work for a full-time employee. And with this position, there's, there's enough work for a full-time employee. I appreciate the explanation. Don't leave, Ben. I'm just I'm going to add on that real quick. There's also benefit to having an employee, uh, since custodians are often in the buildings after hours, so you have added benefit built in security and accountability as well. Okay, uh, through the mayor Ben. Um, between six to ten years ago, because I've, I've been gone six, um, at the plant uh, you were a you were a mechanic, and then when you got your uh, grade three qualifications you automatically became a senior mechanic automatically it was you were just, it was automatic bump because that's that's how it was down there when i was down there so things have changed i mean it was like it was like an automatic uh thing back in the day so it changed and that's why we're adding senior mechanics i mean you could have three guys down there as long as they got their three maintenance uh they were automatically became, you'd have three down there if if they got it so it has it changed in the future that's why we're asking it's for changed where we have the uh, the supervisor so the, hmm? the the mechanic supervisor uh the maintenance mechanic supervisor if i'm saying that right and then there's um one senior budgeted and then there's um the mechanics underneath them and what the, the request is is that um with the off-site um, ponds and the lift stations um that basically he has two crews going where we have a full-time crew that is handling the lift stations the um, uh, with the pumps and the maintenance of those Correct. and keeping up the ponds. Correct. Um, <clears throat> and stormwater ponds in addition to the ponds across the living that we have two seniors. So um, uh, that that one senior will be uh, overlooking the, uh, the offsite and the one senior will be onsite at the plant. And then they would rotate every um, at a certain time period to make sure we're cross-trained and, and working okay but but no they do not automatically bump up we have one budgeted position currently okay thank I'm you ben. thank you welcome with that this is a summary of all the material supply and services changes and I've got detailed slides that show you what's included in some totals here. Um, the fiscal year 20 ongoing requests from the departments that were included in the proposed budget total 409,681. The one-time request, meaning that finance will automatically pull it back next year, total 48,300. We reduced the contingency amount by 250000 for what was added last year as a one-time uh, parking lot holder for <coughs> negotiations for fiscal year 17-18 of 250000 We had a contingency account for, it was called contingency ms and because we had cut everybody's budgets down to the bone back during the recession. So we had an account where we could go to that if somebody really got into trouble and we'd cut budgets too much. We could pull money from there to add to people's budgets. Now that we've added money over the last two or now three years to material supplies and services, we don't need to keep that money there, so we reduce that as well to help balance the budget. Um, internal service funds increased $173,000. I'll show you a breakdown of that in just a minute. Animal control costs went up uh, $35,370. That's related to the six. City's 69% share of the 1718 negotiations cost, along with an increase uh, in fiscal year 20 of 63,500. Other items which were all less than $5,000 netted out to a reduction of about 4,100. Recreation programs declined 2,400, and the fiscal year 19 one-time MSNS increases that were included in last year's budget were 205923 Finance automatically removed those at the beginning of this, this fiscal year's budget process. So 
So the total increase in cost for MSNS, just under 199,000. And I have detailed information coming next, if there's no questions here. This is a breakdown by department. Shows you exactly each and every line item that was requested by each department. And um, frankly, the amount of time committed to this process by the City Council Budget Subcommittee in reviewing all these requests from each and every department. I won't go through each and every line item, but I will scroll through them slowly so that you can see what was requested, why it was requested, and um, it, uh, it adds up to a very big number. So I couldn't really break it down and say, okay, I'm going to show you anything over 10,000 or anything over 5,000 because the number that I would be saying, this is everything below 5,000 would still be a really big number. So um, I'll scroll through these somewhat slowly. Please let me know if there's anything here you would like more information on. Slide includes development services in the police department. Next, the fire department and economic development. This was the slide that you were asking about previously for the changes in economic development. Yes, the professional services went up significantly. These are the items that were included in that. And this is the last page, Community Services, Administration, and Non-Departmental. Through the mayor, um, the administration, professional services reduction, 35,000, was that just because there was 35,000 available in that and then a reduction to it? That's correct. Um, the city manager's budget previously included items to give flexibility for team building, for bringing in, for example, Juan Lopez, mm -hmm. where we might have a need on a citywide basis, but you weren't sure what department to put the budget dollars in. It was included in the city manager's budget, and oftentimes those funds were not spent. Oh. So... Let me go... Let me go to where I'm trying to find the admin budget in here. For the city is that manager. is that the city manager? Oh, thirty-eight. Okay. So it was originally, I guess, and based on the actuals prior year. 38,000, then it was 50,000 and reduced to 15,000. That's the re Yes, that's correct. The, the change. Okay. Um, on the previous slide, um, on the economic development piece, on that public engagement outreach, was that already included in, in that? Previously, or is that something new, too? No, that's something new. I'm, I'm not sure what we're going to be doing with that money. Oh, 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 those different amounts. Okay. <clears throat> well, there I may as well say that on, on the, her question was the public engagement outreach is that what we're talking about event sponsorships for is that this that same category i don't believe it was let me look at my notes okay here. i think because i think we have more than that in there no, it's fifty five thousand. no it was like 42. Oh, 42 i think through the mayor yeah um when we were talking about this in the uh subcommittee going through the budget okay 
We were looking at a lot of the different opportunities that is currently done through the city manager's office. Uh, George does a great job with things, but we were seeing other opportunities that could be leveraged and more technology possibly leveraged to bridge the gap between um, the city and the residents. And so that's where you also get down into the uh, Facebook promotional ads and different things. It was all about exactly what it's, it's public engagement, public mm -hmm. outreach. It wasn't the fundraisers. Sounds similar. Yeah. <clears throat> that, that's, um, I mean, the others seem pretty clear to me, um, Councilman Shaw, that I was just more so with the public engagement outreach and not, is there something that Good you'd question. like to add to that? Yeah, um, Councilman Boomgarden asked some questions via email, so it helped us get ready for tonight by doing our homework and researching. A little some layup of the there. That you might be asking about. Yeah. Um, we included twenty-eight thousand for public engagement outreach, public relations consulting, graphic designs, videos, twelve thousand, flash vote survey software, um, fifty-nine hundred. These were all things that were requested as part of the city's economic development initiatives mm -hmm. and public outreach and engagement. Facebook media promotions, 1,200, and print media, 4,800. And those are all detailed up there as well. But it was all part of um, the initiatives. And uh, follow up through the mayor. Um, if I remember correctly, as we were looking at this and we looked at kind of the potential realignment there of the city manager's office with outsourcing the EDC and really getting the um, the city manager's office engaged with the public. It went kind of hand in hand with the intern. And now here's the, the money to fund the different projects that kind of all came together, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly. It was along those same lines. Yeah, um, I and I, th I uh, again. I think that um, I really appreciate the fact that you're you're looking towards uh, engaging more of our community, which is um, uh, important and valuable. Um, the change between, I guess, I'm just feeling the sense of what we're reducing um, funding and the city managers for professional development and then moving some of that, I believe, I don't know where the funds are coming from, but I'm guessing, yes. Not professional development, it's um, professional services for outsourcing and contracting thank professional you. services. Thank you, thank Just you. Clarify. No, thanks, I appreciate that. Um, my eyes are not always straight here, <laughs> but the contacts are sticking. Um, so, and then we, you know, now in economic development, we have this 28,000. Um, so it, it seems, um, I, I think mostly what I'm considering is who would be managing that particular line item. Is it the economic development group or is it the city manager? So I'm kind of not sure where we're heading in the direction with these, with these particular um, additional new um, proposed um, you know positions or or actions or line items and so again I I'm almost tempted to say look let's leave the proposed for the city manager and hire a really great one an awesome one that we can all support and then move towards um, you know that person perhaps might come with some amazing new vision and ideas that that would us um, just ascend us to amazing economic development. I know, I, I, I used a big word there. Anyway, thank you. While we're on the topic, Robin, before you start, where is the, for the sponsorships and whatnot, where, where would that fund, that figure be? Those are already included in the budget in our non-departmental account. Non I know I had it dog-eared in my copy at home, and I can't find it on this fresh one. What, mm -hmm. um, I know you're keeping a rolling list, and I know we have several applications, requests for funding. Mm -hmm. um, still pending. <clears throat> I would like to work that into our conversation next week, if possible. Okay. Um, what the requests are, and then the allocation that we have designated. So review community contribution requests. And the and fund itself. Yes, thank you. Mm 
Those were on page 86 of the budget. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Is that 86? Thank you. It is. All right, thank you. That information next week and be prepared to discuss it. Um, this next slide shows you the detail of the one time MSNS changes, the material supplies and services that were added on a department by department basis and what they were for, knowing that when it goes into the budget, it's one time in nature and it will come back out next fiscal year. Uh, a breakdown between human resources, the police department, the fire department, and community services. Are there any questions on any of that? These are the changes in the city's internal service funds uh, that were significant in dollar amount, um, including vehicle maintenance, vehicle fuel service charges, liability insurance, the technology replacement fund, and the net of all the other internal service funds in the city. Worth mentioning that the city's internal service funds are set up to recover costs. They're not set up to make a profit. Each year, the charges to the departments uh, generate revenue into the ISF fund, and then it offsets the costs coming into the fund. And we look at every fiscal year to make sure that we have adequate reserves within those funds, but not significant to the point where we're charging departments more than is needed or necessary to keep the fund. Um, whole and in perpetuity through the mayor I feel like I should know this from having worked with this budget <laughs> but I don't and so vehicle fuel charges are they broken out separately in each one of the departments they are each department gets a charge and allocation based upon their historical fuel consumption and finance budgets based upon the dollar amount we expect to be paying for fuel next year. And um, the ISF fund total cost went up 76572 for next fiscal year, and those charges are dispersed out to the departments. So I'm probably jumping way out here because I made an assumption that the vehicle O&M charges, which are dramatically higher in most every department, included fuel. Is that not the case? There's fuel is separate from the O&M charges. Okay. It's included in the same line item in the budget, though. Is that correct, Lynn? Because they roll up? Yeah, they, they roll up together in what's presented here. We have detailed line items that are much lengthier, as you probably recall. I, I do recall. So I guess the question is, uh, and, and I'm just looking at one department here, and their 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 costs went up significantly in vehicle O and M, and there was several of those. So it's, I'm not picking on any one department. Does that include the fuel cost then? It does. Okay. Yeah, because they're rolled up in there. Part of what I think you're seeing there is, in previous years we had some vacancies within fleet maintenance. So we didn't have to charge as much for services because we had some reserve fund balances. This year, we did not have any reserve fund balances left in that fund because they were fully staffed. So we had to pull the full cost through and charge it out to the departments. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. I, I have a question uh, through the mayor. Um, I'm still, this part is um, not clear to me. So the vehicle fuel charges this is a total of the whole all departments or is it separate this is how much it changed for the city's general fund so increased total. Increased. increased okay and we break it out separately so you can see fuel charges which are i would say somewhat beyond the department's control police uh -huh. is going to do patrol they're going to have fuel costs same thing with fire etc but then the vehicle maintenance for the cost of fleet maintenance shop we mm -hmm. show that separately so you can make the distinction between the two. Okay. In the vehicle maintenance, there's an increase. So in the vehicle maintenance, is that's not, oh, that's different than the replacement fund. Okay. Got yes. it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, vehicle replacement is for replacing our fleet. Next, the capital acquisition request for one the second. general fund. One second. Oh, I'm sorry. I just did want to acknowledge, um, I sent a bunch of questions ahead of time, 
And I do very much appreciate the time and effort that went in from not only finance, but my understanding is you, you sent these around to the department heads as well for the answer. So I, I do appreciate that. Um, very thorough, and they did make a lot of sense to me. So I just want to take a moment on the MS and S and the internal service funds. Thank you. You're welcome, and thank you for getting those to us in advance so we could give you comprehensive answers. Thankfully, I type about 90 words a minute, so it really didn't take that long to reply. I wish I read it 90 words a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't, shouldn't have told me that. i got some jobs for you. Yeah. 90 words a minute. Uh-oh. Carol, help. What did I do? Thank you. <laughs> Can't let people leave. I'm not done yet. Okay, capital acquisition request. Um, this shows you uh, for the general fund, we included uh, a flagpole for Plumas Street for the replacement. Um, my understanding is that may not be necessary. We may be able to remove that um, to be determined. The police field operations adding another canine unit at a cost of 10000 As far as vehicles and vehicle replacement, this is a list for you of um, what we're requesting to replace next fiscal year. And um, Councilman Boomgarden asked and inquired why our SUVs all have different prices because we have different needs for those different SUVs, whether it's a police SUV being used for patrol, whether it's um, being used by an investigator or a canine unit, you can see that that's more costly because of the equipment we have to put into it uh, versus a patrol vehicle, uh, replacing two of those. An SUV for the fire department, streets division pickup truck with utility bed, and an infield groomer for the parks division. I think it's important, uh, now's a good time to mention that we have 348,580 of proposed replacement vehicles. We're short in the vehicle replacement fund by $132,212 as far as the amount of money set aside for replacing those vehicles versus the actual cost to replace them. So part of what I'm recommending and bringing forward to City Council for evaluation next week with budget adoption includes taking funds from this year's surplus and front-loading it as of June 30th so that as of July 1st in next year's budget, the dollars will be there to pay for these, these capital acquisition items. It's something that the city has been doing for several years now. The technology replacement fund, we have lots of acquisition items here. Network switches, SASA video surveillance, uh, Yuba City PD video surveillance, server, domain controller, firewall, uh, the police handheld and patrol car radios, 42,800. The police and fire radio system uplift, that's gonna be an end of life here soon. We did not have any money in our technology replacement fund for that. So the budget subcommittee decided to use instead some funds that we had set aside for replacing the laptops in the patrol cars and the fire engines to use half of that to help fund this purchase so it's not entirely short by the 186,000. Um, in addition, uh, an firewall and phone system for uh, both the water and wastewater plants. If I'm remembering correctly, let me look at my notes because I might be wrong on that. I didn't have any further notes on that. I'd have to look at the details. You um, had it. What's that? You wrote it to me. Okay. The water treatment and the wastewater Thank treatment. Thank you. That's what I was remembering, but I like to fact check before I say something out of turn. Um, so thank you. I know it's paid off. <laughs> um, the total amount here that we did not have funds for, for that as well, was $268,800. So that will also come forward as part of the budget resolution request to set aside current year dollars to fund these purchases as well. These are the utility item CAPAC requests. 
Um, does the city council have any request or any questions on any of these items? Pretty detailed. Lots of vowels. <laughs> Lots of vowels. Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, spell check had fun with this. <laughs> to the mayor, is this additional or is this part of the uh, upgrades of the wastewater plant? Uh, all this stuff, is this, this is additional? This is additional, yes. Yeah. Thank you. And total citywide, just over $1.1 million. So we're investing in ourselves and our fixed asset replacements. Probably one of the ugliest charts in my presentation. <laughs> it's our CalPERS uh, blended rates for both safety and red and miscellaneous and blue. Shows you that they do continue to go up. We are projecting a dip in fiscal year 24. I had to check that as a reality check to make sure that yes, it does actually, is it expected to go down slightly for one year? Um, this is uh, stating our CalPERS retirement costs as a percentage for every dollar of city payroll. Safety is in red and miscellaneous in blue, as I stated. It's a blended composite rate of all the tiers that we have within the CalPERS system for safety tier one, safety tier two, et cetera, et cetera, and PEPRA. And we know how much we have in payroll dollars for each of those separate tiers for CalPERS. So we go through and we <coughs> determine what our projected future cost is going to be based upon the normal cost that CalPERS gives us as a percentage of payroll and then how much we have to contribute for our unfunded liability. We're able to then get that total, divide it by the payroll dollars uh, anticipated per the budget process, and give you a percentage of payroll dollars and project <coughs> that forward. This does not include any salary increases anticipated. It's just if we had status quo and everything stayed the same, we are still going to have this much in increases from CalPERS. So I think it's important for city council to see this every year. <coughs> this year's budget again does propose that we prepay our CalPERS UAL payment in July and take advantage of the interest rate discount that CalPERS allows us. I know this slide is really busy. Uh, it's updated and includes the oldest information in red from the 2014 actuarial reports. That really tall blue line at the top was from our 2015 actuarial reports. Then that dropped down to the purple line from the 2016 and the green line from 2017. So as much as CalPERS um, gave us information, it's gotten better since then, but it's still really, really a very large increase. Results in a 75% increase from fiscal year 16. Uh, to the projected amount for fiscal year 25. So not quite double, which is where we started out back in, on the blue line. It's gotten progressively better. The information we have to give to you is only as good as the information CalPERS gives us. And I think we've managed our liabilities and IOUs to CalPERS by doing a variety of things, uh, including trying to combine some one-time salary increases through the negotiations process with ongoing salary increases so that we haven't had as steep of a line as what CalPERS has projected based upon the projections they put into their actuarial reports, which is an increase every year for every single employee. So this is where I show you the magic behind the numbers. This is how much uh, finance is projecting for a surplus for this fiscal year based upon the revenues that we project of $43.6 million for the current year. Grants, which are included in the revenues that will either be spent or carried over, so we deduct those. And then the projected expenditures, which don't include grants, are $42.3 million, a projected surplus of just over a million. And from that... Um, we need 317,000 additional dollars um, to be allocated because of, oh wait, I'm sorry, I'm speaking out of turn here. The 317,000 is something that I'm asking City Council to consider as part of the budget process. We set aside one-time funds within the general fund many years ago 
was originally set aside for economic development initiatives, and the only funds that have been expended from that was to, let me look at my notes here. I don't see it in my notes, but I do recall we spent some money to set up the um, the T bid downtown. It's like one hundred twenty three thousand five hundred dollars to the Chamber of Commerce, if I remember, in fiscal year fifteen or sixteen, and that's the only monies that have ever been spent. The funds were still sitting there as a designation within the general fund uh, until, and they're still there now. We said last year we needed to leave them for a potential match for the safer grant. Well, now we've built in the safer grant expenditures and the safer grant revenues. Both sides of the equation are built into the budget. So I don't see any need to leave those one-time funds set aside. If we don't roll that into fund balance, then we have to come up with 300000 extra dollars to, for our 15% Healthy Cities Reserve set aside. So I'm requesting that City Council take the one-time designation funds and roll them into the unallocated general fund fund balance as part of this budget process, which does help offset the, the next line, which is what I started to speak to first, the increase in the Healthy Cities Reserve of 305138 that's 15% of the increase in our appropriations for the proposed budget, not including the 500000 one-time payment, because that's not really ongoing appropriation, so we don't need to set aside 15% for that necessarily. So those two kind of offset each other. Then the other items for council to consider is uh, $398,086 for the negative police and fire diff balances. Uh, this would be the fourth year that we would be setting aside funds, basically taking general fund money and putting it into the development impact fee fund to try to offset the negative balances where we overexpended police and fire for the police department expansion and fire station four and fire admin building being constructed when we didn't have sufficient funding within the DIF funds. And then the shortages that I already described with technology replacement and uh, vehicle purchases, leaving available funds for one-time purposes of about 266000 from current year resources if we were to do everything that I'm recommending. If there's no questions on that, I will move forward to talk to you about what reserves we do have. So the city's general fund reserves, our healthy cities reserve, um, as of June 1st, 2018, was 6.2 million. We would add 317,594, rolling it right into the city's undesignated general fund reserve fund if city council supports my recommendation of getting rid of the one-time designation funds and rolling it all into regular fund balance. And then the projected remaining surplus from fiscal year 19 of 266,274, which would bring our fund balance to about um, just under 6.8 million as of June 30th of 19. Carol, I'm sorry, I think I'm doing that. Thank you. Our Pension Stabilization Trust, I wanted to show you the history of this. Two million was deposited when we first opened up the trust came from the Economic Stabilization Reserve Fund from fiscal year 15-16. We had investment earnings from fiscal year 17. We contributed 330000 from the end of that fiscal year. Shows you the balance as of June 30th of 17. Some more investment earnings from fiscal year 18. The surplus from fiscal year 18 that was deposited to this fund, showing the June 30th 18 balance of 3065000 we withdrew 500000 last fall to make an additional discretionary payment of 500000 to CalPERS. And then investment earnings um, have been very good this year, 189000 with a projected balance uh, as of June 30th of about $2.75 million.
Thank you. I just hope it doesn't decline before the end of the fiscal year. Through the mayor, I have a question on this pension. Let's see, is there a, a percentage that we're supposed to keep in this trust, or is there anything? This trust can only be used for CalPERS retirement purposes. It can mm -hmm. be used for anything else. Right. Um, but no, it's dictated by the city council for what we can afford to put in it. And then if we decide to take money out um, based upon council's authority, we withdraw the funds and pay it to CalPERS. The problem we have is with a $70 million debt to CalPERS, they're mm -hmm. charging a 7% interest on that. So it's in our best interest to try to whittle it down as quickly as possible mm -hmm. um, and get it paid off. Yeah, I could I could see that based on the other charts. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So I was just wondering, I mean, we couldn't consider going up to a million dollars if we wanted to. We could, but I always look at reserves with a five-year plan in mind. Okay. I wouldn't want to take and send too much in one year because if the city got into trouble with an economic downturn and we had a hard time paying next year's CalPERS increase, we've got a savings account we can count on. So if we had to, we could pull from this to help make the increased payments to CalPERS if next year goes up, say, another 700000 mm -hmm. and revenues are going down, we can rely on mm -hmm. this savings account to help us. So, I mean, based on what you, you, the previous slides I'm looking at, you, we, we gave what? Has the has it 500, 600, and was it 500? Yeah, those are all right here, what we've put in. And then we took out Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. Yeah, 300. Last yeah. Last year. And I'm recommending that we do that again this year. Because if we take 500,000, this is all general fund money. Oh, if we take oh, it and we okay. pay miscellaneous liabilities down, mm -hmm. we get more bang for our buck. I've got um, in my presentation, it's over 800,000 by the time water, wastewater, fleet, and SASA contribute as well. So we, so this is actually well, the pre, with the exception of last year, we gave six hundred and eleven thousand. Yeah, that uh, was from leftover surplus money from the general fund at that, the end of the fiscal year. Councilman Boom Garden's phone over here. My iPad. <laughs> His iPad. <laughs> I think it's recording me. Um, so, <coughs> couldn't we go up seven hundred? We can. Let's get to where I'm talking more about that. Okay. And um, I, I, I'm just asking. I'm not no, making no, no. this it's final. Great I'm just kind of looking at where we came more. up with a. I just don't want to see the city get into problems later. And because if the general fund contributes 500 towards the miscellaneous plan, all the employees on a citywide basis water, wastewater, fleet maintenance staff, and SASA staff would contribute a portion as well. If I remember the dollar amount, it was about 837000 So it, it creates a significant dent in reducing liabilities and future interest charges. All right. Okay. The general CIP fund, we start... Um, with 4.768 million available, we already have 2.7 million allocated to projects. The proposed general CIP fund uh, budget for fiscal year 1920 allocates another 1,149,500, and Ben will be discussing CIP with you next. Um, I recommend setting aside a designation for unexpected emergency needs of 500,000. That's kind of the just do not touch in case you have an emergency, you need to take care of something. It gives the city resources to do so. And then that leaves an unallocated remaining balance available of 414400 <coughs> And this is the general fund share of the vehicle replacement fund. It does not include um, the dollars that are held sort of in trust, if you will, for water, wastewater, et cetera. It's just the general fund share. The projected balance as of July 1st, 
$7.786 million. Vehicle Replacement Fund is budgeted to receive $800,000 from the general fund. We have purchases that total $348,580. We're proposing to transfer in, as of June 30th, the unfunded amount of 132212 which would bring the general fund's share of vehicle <coughs> replacement to just under $8.4 million. It would be higher than that because there would also be interest earnings, but um, it gives you an idea of where we're at with the general fund, vehicle replacement fund. This shows you the city's long-range financial forecast for the next five years and includes the, the actuals through fiscal year 18, the FY19 projected, FY20 budgeted as proposed, and then future year forecasts. But what this does um, not factor in is the downturn in the economy. <coughs> I always have to throw that caveat in there. This projects revenues continuing on um, as they have historically. And to give you an idea of the CalPERS increases that we're anticipating, this includes in the expenditure projections 755,000 for fiscal year 21 CalPERS increases, 600, just under 666,000 for fiscal year 22 CalPERS increases, 525,900 for fiscal year 23, a reduction of 76,500 in fiscal year 24 and an increase of 342,000 in fiscal year 25. So that's built into this model, knowing that we have to pay CalPERS first, so to speak. Um, this also includes uh, an ongoing increase of 3% in the city's property tax growth for the out years, 2.5% for sales tax, 3% in franchise fee revenues, 4% for hotel motel surcharge revenues, et cetera. This does not take into consideration an economic downturn. So as much as it looks like we have a balanced budget, and we do, that's subject to change based upon the economy if it takes a turn. So when, when that does happen, we will need to react and reevaluate our priorities to avoid deficit spending. <coughs> I stuck questions in here, but I also have one more slide for wrap-up items for discussion and consideration. I, I think we have a lot more probably to discuss than the items on my next slide, but these are all items uh, for council consideration as it relates to the draft staff report related to the budget that I would be bringing back to you next week. I created a separate slide just to make sure that what I bring to you is direction that you want me to implement from a budget perspective. So the question items were funding um, the techno technology replacement cash deficiencies of 268.8 uh, and the vehicle replacement fund deficiencies of 132,212 from the existing June 30th, 19 anticipated surplus whether to continue the developer impact fee fund loan repayment um, advances of 10% for the negative balances for police and fire, whether or not to roll in the reserve for operations into the regular fund balance unreserved, and then whether or not to make an additional discretionary payment to CalPERS. The total for all funds was 837808 So yes, we get more bang for our buck. You're looking. So, so you're looking for direction on these items or just these? Are the direction on these items and then items that you would like me to bring back um, as part of the budget staff report for modifications to the proposed budget as well. Is this the time, through the mayor, is this the time for me to ask my questions? Yes, if, uh, but I have one if you don't mind because I know you have, probably have several. <clears throat> Robin, this... Um, Money that's a part of our surplus. So this particular those lower two, right? The five hundred and three hundred seventeen k. It's so, you're out. You're requesting that we do that with our with some anticipated surplus, correct? Um. Uh, no, the five hundred thousand would come from our pension stabilization trust. 
okay, transfer it to the CalPERS from the stuff because that's already so yeah. that's already required to go towards CalPERS anyway. <laughs> it absolutely. All right, is. How about the three seventeen? The three seventeen is money that's sitting in the city's general fund. Okay. And it's designated one time monies. So it could only, as it was set aside by council previously, it was to be used for one time purposes, whether it was an economic development initiative, a match for the safer grant, for example. Um, and the reality is, is if we do not, <coughs> direction, if we don't roll it into fund balance, we have to come up with 305,000 to meet our 15% reserve requirement. So what I'm saying is if we roll this into fund balance, it matches our 15% reserve requirement. Why have it as a separate designation of money just sitting there not benefiting our community? And council may want to leave it there and say that we might have one-time needs that come up down the road. I'm thinking negotiations is what I'm thinking of because we're way short on where we'd like to be. Um, but if if it's 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 pay me now or pay me a letter regarding the three seventeen versus the three hundred five anyway, so it's already a wash. So it's not a legitimate source of right. All right. But by rolling that in, I'm matching what's needed to hit our fifteen percent. All right. So we're not having to take it out of current year revenues. Right. So what we're looking at is a two sixty six, not yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Through the mayor, may I? Mr. McGarden, follow up on one of his questions before you go. Uh, something you said on the uh, ADP for CalPERS, the 500, um, you said that was required. That's not our current liability. You're just talking about the additional payment that we would possibly be making. That's what that is. And I want to make sure I've got it correct and we're clear. It's not a required payment. This is, okay. The only requirement is that we can only use the monies in the pension right. stabilization fund to pay CalPERS. But what that means is we could also reduce the current budget by 500000 and say, okay, we're going to supplant that to pay CalPERS so that we're not having to cover it in our budget, which is why I don't advocate sending them more than 500000 because I want to save that as our savings account for PERS in case something down the road where it's needed. Right. I just wanted to make sure we were clear because I could have swore I heard you say it was a required payment and I meant. I may have, and if I did, I'm sorry. Thank okay. you for the clarification. Uh, another thing, just to make sure I heard you correctly, once we put money into that PERS account, it's there to stay. It can only we, be used for PERS. Right. So there's yes. no, if we, we hit, a, hit a bump on the road economically, we can't pull that out anymore. We're done. No, you can still pull it out, but it can only be pulled out for PERS. But for but other but stuff, we're, we're done. If you needed a million bucks, Right. You could reduce how much we budget for PERS by a million bucks, pull a million out of there, and send it to CalPERS. It can only be used for PERS. Once we put it in there. Yes. So if we increase the amount we put in there, we're, we're, we're trapped in that, in that pigeonhole. You are, but okay. as long as you send it to PERS, then if you owe PERS, I'm just going to throw out a number. Let's say it's $9 million. You owe PERS $9 million. You could budget $8 million and pull a million out of there and send it to PERS, and we've met our obligation to PERS for the year, but you didn't have to do it all through the operating budget. Right. This is a nice savings account for the city. No, I, I agree with that. My point is I'm looking at if we hit an economic downturn and we need 500 k but we took that extra 500 k put it in this account, we can't pull it back out to use it for We're something else. For That's my question. Well. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. You might want to follow me page by page here. Okay. So page nine, I just have, most of these are just questions for, for understanding. On page nine, there's a, an item called recology rate stabilization. Can you help me understand what that accounts for? I received your email this afternoon, so I printed out the current balance. As of today, we have 20465 in that account. And I told Terrell I was going to put her on the spot because she knows more about this than I do to try to explain it. Sorry, Terrell, you're up. I appreciated the heads up, actually. <laughs> <clears throat> so I, um, the easiest way for me to explain this is to uh, read the section of the staff report that we took to council last August, which we did every year for the term of the 2011 contract. 
So um, in 2008, the Regional Waste Management Authority members established a rate stabilization and capitalization fund as part of Ecology's solid waste approval process. The fund was established to reduce volatility in year-to-year -year rate adjustments and fund one-time capital improvement costs. Use is guided by the rate stabilization and capitalization fund distribution guidelines attached, and I can provide you guys with a copy. So the fund has worked as intended. Previous disbursements from the fund have supported following projects, levy road improvements, and this was um, with all the regional waste management jurisdictions, we paid a portion of the cost, and they did as well. So the total cost for levy road improvements was um, 128,803, and required intersection safety improvements, 505,021, um, landfill gas control at the closed YSDI landfill, 284,000, south area stormwater improvements, 230,000, Feather River Organics Compost Pad Stormwater Improvements is 326000 and Green Waste Diversion Program, which was 683000 So a total of about just under $2,200,000 um, was spent through this fund. And through that, um, um, we also um, kept the rates stable so that one year the rates didn't go up 3%, the next year they stay the same, then maybe after that they go down like, you know, 5%. So everybody was paying the same rate until it reached a certain point and then we were able to raise it. So um, does that answer your question? It I, does. I have more if you want more. <laughs> I can come see you. I just, it, it just, uh, I was just trying to understand what that line was about. And I think, um, I think with the current um, agreement that will be in place in 2019, that will probably um, not go forward. Okay. Thank you. Next um, is page 11, and this is where I get to uh, thank my colleagues, Councilman Sean, Councilman, excuse me, Mayor Harris, for their work on uh, taking the time to go through this budget with uh, city staff. Um, I think it's important to note, and this is more for information than anything else, under the uh, legislative and administrative grouping of accounts, um, they were able to lower that by 10.76% from last year, um, significant cut. Finance uh, went up uh, only 3.19%, uh, development services up 3.62%, police 4.84%, Fire, 3.03%. Public Works, 3.7%. I guess the one question I have is HR, not to pick on you, Natalie. HR went up 13.24%. And I'm, I'm assuming, I think I have the answer, but I would be interested to know uh, why such an increase in, in HR. A lot of it. Natalie might want to add here, but a lot of it is the MS and S that we added um, for these items here. I assume a lot of it's because we're negotiating with eight different units right now. Okay. Yes. yes. So, too, you answered your own question. It's primarily do these negotiation costs. So, particularly this labor relations, the lead, that's for IEDA, and that was part of their cost, that was part of their contract. If we go into negotiations into next year, that's the cost to negotiate. Okay. Also, maybe you can take a moment just to let us know more about Project Arrow. Yes. So Project Project Arrow is um, part of our target learning, is kind of our um, encompassing program for target learning, which is primarily those costs are for training. So as part of... Um, Target learning, we bring in trainers during um, the year to educate our employees. Okay. Kind of a succession planning thing? Yes. All right. Yes. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, and this might be page 12. This might be one of the things the mayor was looking at, at is uh, just understanding what non-departmental the budget number is is significant. So I'm trying to understand what what encompasses non-departmental? Anything that we cannot assign to a department or that historically has not been assigned to a department. I'm going to put a page in here. Okay. 
Let me find that page and then I can try to walk you through some of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lynn. I'd have been a while finding it. So it's actually, the bulk of it is on page 86. And it shows the breakdown there, 27000 for advertising, 20000 for professional services, 170000 for professional development. That's the citywide pooled travel and training account that anybody that is funded through the general fund goes to a conference or does any travel or training. It's paid for out of this account. It went down 30000 this year because we shifted thirty from the pooled account back to the fire department. And dues and subscriptions, that includes SACOG, dues and subscriptions. Help me out, Terrell. I know you manage those. Do you remember what some of the other ones are? Uh, League of California City, SACOG, Chamber of Commerce, those type of organizations. But um, League of California Cities and SACOG is the largest amount. And I'm looking at the increase by my non-departmental to see what the increase is in other materials and supplies. We added 5,000 for community events and 1,400 <coughs> for community contributions. Those are included in other materials and supplies. Well, that was one of my questions is we went from 54,900 to 105,900. Seems like an awful large jump there. I can help with that too if you'd like. Thank you. So, <laughs> so um, the biggest part of it was we consolidated the um, Fly the Mission, which is the um, it's fifty five thousand, which is what we've been spending on um, leadership development. The academies that we send, um, we call it up the hill. To um, so it's pretty much the leadership development portion and. Um, that goes along with that with um, Amistad, Juan Lopez, professional services. Thank you, Terrell. Councilman Boomgarden, uh, that was actually one of the questions we had going through. And some of the variances you might see through the budget is fly the mission, for example. It was so scattered throughout the budget that we sat there and said, how much are we really spending? So we asked staff to try to consolidate as many places as they could so we could actually see what we're spending on these, these types of events. I understand, thank you. On page 19, um, we show a position for Sabufka. And I'm wondering. That can now be removed. Okay. Oops. Only a few more. <laughs> On page 26, Madden House rent, it's shown as, as a zero. I thought this was the year we were going to start getting rent. You are correct. You okay. got me on that one. Okay. Well, I'm not trying to get you. <laughs> I know, but that's okay. I can own it. <laughs> okay. So we'll add that in as an additional revenue. The rent is supposed to be twelve fifty per month. And we set aside half of it for maintenance type big issue repairs into a CIP fund. But I will add the budget amount uh, for the other half, which is roughly $7,500. That just might offset the 8000 for the maintenance, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. um, page 34. This is... This is our page as city council, just under, trying to understand what the $2,900 for professional development is allocated for. I want to know how I'm going to be professionally developed, I guess. Want me to answer that too? <laughs> You're on a roll. Thank you, Terrell. <laughs> so um, it's professional development is um, for meetings and things like that. So it's the, um, the cost of... Um, when you're having business meetings, closed session. So the, um, and then I think part of it is for um, when you give um, recognition 
to some organizations and things like that. So a special event, if we're wanting to do something like that, if it comes up, like when we had it's a couple of years back, but the um, um, California Chrome event and then <laughs> some of the other events. So it gives council a little bit of flexibility in case something comes up during the year. But and the primary portion of it is um, for um, closed session type um, meals and things. Okay. It would seem that, that if we were recognizing groups, that should be part of a different line item than professional development. I guess I look at professional development as what are we doing to further our abilities as a city council person or something. So in, in your in your uh, effort to try to consolidate things to where they more may more appropriately land, that might be something that we should consider. We can move that to other materials and supplies. It seems like it would be more appropriate there. Um, I think a lot of these you've, we've already addressed, so bear with me a little bit. A lot of these had to do with vehicle O&M. That's the only reason I... And then we talked about the, the non-departmental. That concludes my questions. And again, I want to thank uh, Councilman Shaw, Mayor Harris, and, and you all for your preliminary work on this. I know there's going to be some more questions to be addressed, but uh, appreciate the patience with the questions, both the ones I submitted and those tonight. Thank you. And thank you to staff for uh, participating and giving me the answers as well. Appreciate it. For the pleasure of the council, would you like to move forward with the CIP budget presentation and the water and wastewater rates and then come back to this and tell me what items you would like me that you recommend that I bring back for change as part of the proposed budget? Or would you like to go through the proposed budget and let me know how to modify my staff report so I can bring it back accordingly? I'm good either way. I know we gave you a punch list already. Are you looking for additional items? Is that we, there are. If there are any. Okay. Do we have anything else we'd like to address? I don't have any. Through, through the mayor, I just wanted to have... Um, now keep going back. It's not clear in my mind yet, and I want to make sure that I have that that pension stabilization trust um, because I think I'm confusing the um, the 500 that we're proposing um, for this fiscal for 1819 is is going to come out of the trust, correct? It would, and it would reduce, if you will, the balance down to 2.2 .2 million. <clears throat> Okay, so it's coming out of, of that. It come out of this money, yes. Okay. And for me, my recommendations that I bring forward to the council, it's a delicate balance between, okay, we don't want to pay 7% interest on a $70 million debt indefinitely, so we want to whittle it down, but how much is too much to pay? I wouldn't recommend taking the whole $2.7 million, right. chucking it at the debt to try to bring the debt down and save interest, just because then that limits your flexibility down the road with your ability to deal with a changing economy and still pay CalPERS rates that are doing this. Then on the very last slide that you had, because that was one of your questions um, or consideration, right? Yes. 500 general fund, ADP, and then CalPERS the total. So the total is that? The total includes water, wastewater, wastewater. Oh. Fleet, and SASA share. Because mm. in order to pay down the miscellaneous liability, mm -hmm. all the employees that are covered under the miscellaneous actuarial plan, everybody needs to pay their fair share. Got it. And that's okay. why I'm recommending a miscellaneous payment is because we can get more bang for our buck and save more interest mm. versus if we did safety, 500000 equals 500000 Right. It's all general fund. Right. Oh, that makes sense now to me. Okay, what you're saying. Thank you. I appreciate it. Through the mayor. 
Um, as far as how we proceed, and you and I have been through the budgetary process, so I can handle it either way we want. I would ask uh, our council members that, you know, do they need to hear the other two presentations before they can, you know, help provide direction to staff or what that's going to do to staff or is how we proceed here. Right, and, that's, and that is the question. If we're mm -hmm. good for this item, move on to the next ones, or do you want to wait until the end? It, it, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. Through the mayor, I, yes. if you don't mind, um, if you could read what you have already, that way we can figure out whether there needs to be any additions on this operating budget. The direction, there was a lot of discussion, so the direction portion coming <coughs> from the five of you wasn't real clear to me. Um, the Yuba Sutter Lodging Association amount for 127640 that was getting tabled for further evaluation based upon their coming in and giving you guys a presentation. So that was, in my mind, I marked that as a to be determined. For now, it's not to be included in the proposed budget until you've heard their presentation. <coughs> Placeholder, if you will. Okay, so Just I in case it is approved. Okay, so leave it there for now, pending action. Right. Okay. Making sure that I've got agreement. Are there three nods? That was our, my understanding from the beginning. That's what we're doing. That okay. yeah. Thank you. Um, the Economic Development Corporation contribution of 52000 was something else that generated a lot of discussion. I My understanding, I think, is that that was staying in the proposed budget, but correct me if I'm wrong, please. I think we were going to let the new city, do the mayor. I think we were going to let the new city manager determine that position in the uh, administrative department. So I guess we need to budget. That, that was a suggestion, not a decision. Yeah, yeah that was a suggestion. I would, uh, another placeholder in my opinion, unless you, you have anything to contribute on that one? I think it needs to be in the budget. Okay. The EDC fifty two thousand. Yes. Okay. Okay. So. Yes. Budget. There's three nines. Yeah. There you go. There was also discussion as it relates to our economic development public affairs manager being remaining in the budget. Um, it is not in the budget now. Is there a desire to add it back? That's what was discussed earlier, or two of us had discussed it, letting the city manager make the decision. That's what you were talking about. Right, that that's what I was talking about. Any thoughts on that? Um, my thought is I stand by what uh, we did in the subcommittee, and uh, I think it needs to be defunded at this time with the possibility of joining the EDC. Okay. I support uh, the recommendation of the budget subcommittee. I am questioning the decision to remove the economic development position um, in the sense of what we have with the economic commission. So I'm just confused on that particular, um, how that's going to be then um, folded in if we went to the EDC. So that's, I, I'm just asking that as a question for clarification um, in that decision to... Um, move in that direction. Was that um, taken into consideration? Well, it was kind of, kind of a little bit different strategies here, but Economic Development Commission is exactly that. We already were familiar with the mission. Where we're just basically expanding their purview specific to issues involving Yuba City interests. Mm -hmm. Economic Development Commission, the 52,000, would be not only they would assist us, but it's more of a broad community-based approach. Right. No, I I'm, 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 <clears throat> understand the EDC part of it, the Economic De Development Corporation, their role. Um, when Brenda Strandix gave us a presentation on that, I'm clear on that. I'm just... It's not clear to me in how that the corporation, the EDC corporation, then would um, utilize our commission um, that we have currently. And as we are modifying and moving funds around, how that would um, change that particular role of our commission. I know that it doesn't necessarily supplant, 
the EDC commissions, it's more Yuba City specific. So they will they will work in cooperation and communicate with one another, mm -hmm. just like they do they would have done now if we were mm -hmm. still part of a membership program. But um, so that would be. Are you saying that we should have one or the other, not both? I, I'm I'm just asking how that <coughs> decision was determined by both of you because it, the corporation has a board, and it already has an existing group where they meet to discuss regional issues, and so I think we're considering that that's we're going to be part of that and how is would would our commission group then potentially cost us more money for Brenda to work with them to fold them in or would they be part of that board you know that's uh, there it's um it's separate so who would run that particular um that's yet to be determined okay so that wasn't yeah decided that's yet to be determined yeah. okay um yeah, I, I stand. I think the city council, um, excuse me, the city manager needs to make that decision. So I would hope that that administrative decisions in that particular area, I, I think the city, incoming city manager needs to make that decision. All right, okay. Okay. Good point. Very tough decision, but very interesting decision. Uh, but you have three nods. The community coordinator position was discussed. I think we have direction to remove that. Yes, for now, unless you have commentary on that. Um, the only My only thinking behind that, at the time that we discussed it in the subcommittee, it seemed to be the logical um, fit. But after listening tonight and having consideration over the last few weeks, um, that one position, I think, really needs to wait until the city manager, the new city manager is, is here and let them best describe what they need in support for that position that's that's not at the level that we had, but yet in that supportive role to accomplish the mission. So I would, I would be fine with leaving that to the uh, new city manager, but I honestly think it needs to be in the budget because if it's not in the budget, then we're not, we're basically telling the new city manager, you can decide what you want, but you got no money. <coughs> So I think we could leave it in the budget, but um, not filled or done anything until the new city manager gets here, and it can be brought back at it, much like what we're doing with the, if the tourism. If the city manager decides not necessarily necessary, and they can adapt and to fulfill those needs that we had anticipated for that position, so be it. Moments we can we can do with that. They would roll, yeah, roll back into the general fund. Right. So I, I would. You want to keep it or not? Okay. <laughs> the bugs following me. Keep it in the budget mm -hmm. because you know, not no no issue with leaving it to be utilized by the the new city manager. But if we do not budget for something, then we're telling the new city manager, mm -hmm. tell us what you need. But there's no money. So the prudent thing to do is to budget the 78, I think it was 71 or 81,000, leave it there and let the new city manager determine what he needs and let it be a placeholder. The person, yeah. The or person. she, the person, he, she, the new city manager. But we need to fund it in the budget or we, we're not I would be okay up. with having the money set aside but with not giving a specific title. Because I think that then that person can decide what that role may look like. I think we have to give a title to live the money there. You can't leave it. Or you can put it in, um, what is it, professional development or services or other materials. It's, you can keep the money in that line item. So. so be it. So be it. So be it. Thank you. So it stays. Stays for now. But yeah. we're not going to worry about the. We're not going to uh, include the title. No title. All right. That's fine. And through the mayor? Yes. I think we need to find out through Economic Development Corps if uh, they're going to take our seven-member board. Is it going to be an extra fee or if it's all going to be part of the fee? And Because we, we might have to have money in the future for that also. Separate. Separate? Separate. So we have money already separated for that. The EDC is separate, just like Planning Commission and everything, Youth Commission and everything else. It's separate. Okay. Through the mayor, yes. just clarification, this commission, like the Planning Commission, the Parks and Rec Commission, these are all advisory um, bodies to the City Council, correct? Yes. Thanks. The last item I had on my list um, that we talked about earlier was the building maintenance worker and whether that position should stay in or be removed. 
I think it's a which should stay in. It's a valuable asset to our community. Uh, we can get things done, save on paperwork, especially if there's something needs to be fixed ASAP. It, it could be done immediately. We don't have to wait for uh, you know a bid to come in and a contractor to do the work. And it is. It was in the. It was in the, It was here in the past, and it is a valuable asset for keeping these buildings up in our community and our city for our city buildings. Yeah. Right. Through the mayor, I was the one that raised the question about it. I'm, I was satisfied with uh, Ben Moody's answer in regards to the justification. Now I'm going to look to my colleagues on both sides and ask, did I miss anything? Okay, <coughs> apparently I did. Um, the flagpole that we've included mm -hmm. in the general fund uh, got back. Can I remove that item because we're adding it in other ways? We have the uh, CDBG for playground. That's playground. You already get that? Okay. Yes, I have note of that. And then um, re requested a, a, the, a summation of the community contributions to request on file. Yes, and we'll bring that back that. on the June 4th meeting. All right. That's all I've got written down. <laughs> uh, removing the Sabuka position because they've hired it. Yes. Directly. Okay. Lynn, did you have anything? No. Okay. I think we're. Yes, I've got that. Thank you. <laughs> I have. Twenty years for that. I know, right? They put on a budget presentation one time where it was called "Stump the Chump." You've officially stumped me. You got me. <laughs> uh, through the mayor. Um, going to your. Uh, consideration items um, the top ones I have no issue with the very last one um, mr. mayor and the rest of the council uh, if you're interested in and uh, holding that one back and the reason is is we're about to sit down with the public and talk about PERS and I think it would be putting the cart in front of the horse without having those discussions without the public's understanding and input as to what we're doing. Because last year when you made that payment, it was September or October anyway. Um, you know, I, I would just, I just don't want us to authorize and, you know, July 1, we make a, you know, half million dollar payment and we go sit down with the public on the 7th or 8th and it's kind of a mute point. I, I think the public needs their their voices heard in, in this and I think that we just need to hold off on making the payment at this time until we go through the process. When was the intent to make the payment, write the check? Um, we have no time certain to do it because it's an additional discretionary payment. We have to notify our actuary well in advance of making it and set up the timing with them. We need to withdraw the funds from the pension trust fund. It takes time. So what I would propose is at this juncture, leaving it in the budget, but directing me to hold off until the pension committee has met and it's been discussed more in detail, not to proceed with actually taking action and doing anything with it. Because um, we do have it built into the budget at this point. I would hate to take it out only to put it back in in three to six months. But you can direct us not to make any payments, additional discretionary payments, beyond the prepayment in July. That makes sense, and I think mm -hmm. I have your authorization for that. Um, but as far as this goes, we can hold off until you direct me to do so. How long does it take to, if you're going to make the payment as soon as possible, how long that would take? If we but, say go ahead yeah, and do it, we wouldn't do it till after July first okay. because we want it to. We have it's built in a next year's budget, so I don't have the authority to make it before that anyway. So you need a month's notice. Yeah. Okay, then that would be okay with holding off and sp and speaking with our group. We're not mm -hmm. meeting until July, so. like two weeks. But yes. All right. Thank you. And we have how long to make the payment? We have clerk till December thirty first. Extra payment. Yeah, yeah, we can do it any time before June thirtieth. <clears> yeah. yeah. But if we made it now, it would save us interest combined from now till June 30th of next year. If we, made it, if we made it after July 1st. Yeah. It would save 7% interest. And that's what I look at. It's a balancing act. I hate to pay PERS interest on something that gets us nothing. Here, here. 
So if I'm hearing correctly, then my direction is to hold off on making the payment, but I'm okay to leave it in the budget as it's proposed. For That's what I've heard. That I would concur. So. Duly noted. Duly noted. Thank you. Mayor. Uh-oh. I would like to note that this is Robin's final budget workshop before her retirement at the end of the year. And so I just want to say she did, she and her team did a phenomenal job. And thank you very much, Robin. Thank you, Robin. Always do a good job. All right, we're back. We're back on? Thank you, Ben. All right, so what's do it? Um, you know, I always like to, to say, uh, this is one of the best jobs, is in especially dealing with the CIP, because all of this um, uh, wrestling over money and where it goes, I get to spend it. And so I would say I get one of the best jobs is when I get to work, talk about the CIP and look forward to the next projects I get to put out for the town. So, um, so with this, um, this is a, a review of the 1920 Capital Improvement budget and uh, it's really um, the focus on priority projects for street water wastewater and um, facilities it's it's really a high level um, focus on the priority projects piggybacking off the transportation workshop in february and the goals and priority workshop in march and so it's really intended to be an interactive uh, discussion and please ask questions as we're going through it so um so with this um it's definitely hard to read with this um, with the screen and everything small, but it's just kind of really a snapshot of North Yuba City. Um, the stuff in colors basically shows different projects that are funded through that CIP. So it's existing projects and new projects that show how they're scattered out around the city from striping projects, ground um, <clears throat> water well abandonments to um, projects at um, the police department, Civic Center Field, to the North Plant and across the city. And with it, that's... Uh, the south half of Yuba City. So I'm going to start off with getting into streets. So our biggest priority project that's funded out of the streets and roads CIP is the Fistry Bridge Replacement Project. Um, everybody's aware of the Fistry Bridge Replacement Project. It's um well, well let me back up a little bit. So with with the streets um, and roads CIP for 19 and 20 for the 1920 fiscal year budget, we've programmed $2.4 million. And so that's really a base um, budget. There's no um, big grants, there's no $70 million uh, bridge coming in. That's really what your um, TDA, your transportation tax, and your SB1 money that's coming in. Um, and so it's really a base year. And so uh, typical projects in the street cover maintenance, um, which includes striping projects, marking, drainage improvements, stormwater activities, traffic signal work, and various uh, road rehab and improvement projects. So really when you look at that long list there in the street and road section of the CIP, that's pretty much what those that section is covering. And so when then we get into the, the priority projects, we have the Fifth Street Bridge Replacement Project. It's currently under construction with a July 2020 completion date. Um, July, August is what we're shooting for. Near-term work involves uh, constructing the approach, finishing the approach work on both Yuba City and Marysville side. Bridge Street widening, this has uh, been determined as a priority project and staff is currently working through finalizing those plans and specs, relocating three residences um, through relocation services. We're getting ready to demo the uh, 640 Brown house here in the next week or so. You'll see that one come down. And then <clears throat> basically the plan is to come to finalize those plans and specs um, and come to council sometime this summer, fall, um, and we approve those plans and specs and with a funding strategy that, that we could then put out the bid in, um, in the winter. Franklin Avenue Pedestrian Improvement Project. This is a, a nice um, little improvement project from Franklin Avenue between Palora and Gray. Um, it's got a mixed bag of money um, where we're using ATP grant money, some county um, portions, uh, some SB1 money, and then other local sources of money. We're, um, we've just sent that in for the request for approval from Caltrans, and we're hoping within the next month or so we'll get word back to give us the okay to bid it. So that'll be, um, we're looking forward to a summer construction if it comes through. Um, and then we got the Sutter Bike Path Closure, which is a, which is a big project. 
two and a half million dollars. We're working th through um, finalizing the um, property acquisition um, for the project and then also um, uh, SACOG program the money in 2021, I believe is what, so we're working through the design right now and then setting ourselves up to do that, that bike. Bike get yeah, the basically it's the bike path extension from Hooper Road to Harder Parkway and then doing a shared path along Harder Parkway between Butte House Road and Highway 20. And then uh, I just had a road maintenance uh, a placeholder in here this year. Typically that float fluctuates from half a million to a million depending on available TDA money and what other projects we program. This year we have it at 500,000 um, just because the way our TDA allotment came in and different projects, um, it wasn't a big year for road rehab. And so as we've talked in the transportation workshop, that's always a big struggle where you're looking at that seven to eight million dollar need. Water CIP. So the water plant off of Northgate and Live Oak Boulevard. Um, we're proposing a $7.7 million budget with a large portion of that $7.7 .7 million uh, this year coming from approximately a $3 million um, Cali o OES FEMA um, anticipated funding for um, damage to the low lift road going up to um, along the river um, north of the Feather River Parkway up into the low lift intake. There was storm damage, damage with the Orville incident and so of that 7.7, .7, million is really a placeholder for our application to get funded. We're still waiting to actually um, to, to see if that comes in or not, it comes to fruition. So projects in the uh, water fund typically cover uh, maintenance items, which is water meter installation, fire hydrant, relocations, um, distribution, um, repairs, you know, recoding water storage reservoirs, and then we have improvement projects with groundwater wells and hydro pneumatic tanks. And so with the priority projects for 1920, one of the big ones that we've been trying to um, help with the system is the pressure, pressure surge relief facility, which basically is gonna put hydro pneumatic tanks at, um, at the treatment plant and then possibly in the distribution system to handle those spikes when we have that intermittent power loss and it basically has this water hammer effect on our system that's causing a lot of damage throughout the system and leaks and, and compounding problems with maintenance. So, and then uh, that one we've, we're getting, my, my understanding is we're getting close to design, um, working through the design element and um, hopefully this year we come up, we finalize that design and then we're able to bring a project forward. The cellular water meter replacement, this is a, a nice project where we're gonna swap out those radio reads with uh, cell um, heads, which gives more options for users to know um, wh how much water they're using on, on a day-to-day on day -day basis. And we had a $4 million grant, um, repayment grant with that. So the cost is, it's $8 million project with $4 million um, uh, forgiveness loan. Berry School water line transmission, uh, the project plans and specifications have been sent into um, the state and they're working through that funding agreement. We're hoping, to, uh, we're pushing to get the state to move forward with that funding agreement so we could push that project out. Second groundwater well, $4 million project. This is uh, really in its infancy of a multi-year project. It's to put a new um, second, uh, a new uh, groundwater well um, at the water treatment plant. We've received about a $750,000 grant from um, the Board of Reclamation um, towards that grant and, uh, and we're working through the environmental process right now. And then, um, then we will we have funding agreement with the, the Board of Reclamation with the feds and then we'll move into the design process. And so, um, some of these are self-explanatory with the water treatment, electrical and instrumentation improvements. Uh, it's real similar to what we're doing at the wastewater plan, but basically we're looking at starting, um, uh, updating the systems to, um, so they all talk the same language. They, they all have the same software um, and they, uh, they meet the needs, the current needs since they're old and outdated. And they, they meet the different capacity with fiber um, and data and, and different processing new control units to those um, variable speed motors and different control systems. And so with that, there's a SCADA master plan 
Um, they kind of look at like a master plan document on how to get there and then they start putting money towards um, doing those improvements. The new project, the highlight on here is the Plumas Water Tower Maintenance Project. They call that out. It's $135,000 and, and what that's programmed to fund is the Plumas Street Water Tower, it's, it's, um, it's rusting. It has um, some equipment on there that needs to take, be taken off. And so what we're looking at is basically the cost to go up there, clean it, patch it, prep it, and prime it and paint it. And so with it being um, so tall, <coughs> uh, it, it's expensive. And so we typically have a uh, recoding reservoirs fund and a, um, uh, and a maintenance fund for um, f recoding reservoirs and then a Funds are programmed into maintaining recoding water storage reservoirs. We propose to basically use uh, the, the funds, for, instead of funding those accounts, typically at, at the half million mark, where um, we reduce some of those funds in order to program this. Through the mayor. On the water tower bin, I know that's going to be all cosmetic because the t water tower has been used for many years. Is that counting, the 135, is that counting the uh, artwork that council would like to be put up there? It does not. It does not. So it, that would be separate. Um, if, if, if in the future the uh, city council wants to move forward with um, artwork or repainting that, then we would have to consider that price at that time and how we would fund it. So when so this is just going to strictly uh, maintain that structure with basically repainting it. You're going to get a paint job out of it. Okay. Now, when we do this, this could be a whole bunch of scaffolding and stuff up on that, isn't there? You know, my understanding from uh, our project manager has got quotes is there's really just tall lifts. There's really super okay. tall lifts and um, th there'll definitely have to be some coordination on how we set up in, in Plumas Street where it's a tight situation on how you get a lift that tall and, and, and get traffic up and around. But it's a, it's a tall lift. Okay. Thank you, Ben. All right, wastewater CIP. So the 1920 program budget amount is $3.6 million. Um, again, this is a base amount with no anticipated grants or special funding um, coming into play this year. So the primary projects there, the one that is going on right now is the wastewater treatment facility improvement project, close to $23 million. As you know, this project involves improvements to the headworks, digester, electrical and dewatering system and improvements. It's ongoing. Um, currently new outfall that's a big project um, i'm just showing that as as a project that we're currently working through that budget amount isn't until future years right now we've budgeted um, design and so we're working through the design options and design costs with jacobs engineering um, to try to figure out the most efficient and reliable location to put that diffuser into the river for a new spot um, wastewater system master plan we are, um, that number, I want to say that's a carryover number from before. We've actually contracted with West Coast uh, Engineering for, uh, for less money. That's been the, the council, I believe, with the, with the award to uh, West Coast, and we're working through that right now. And then we have the, uh, the sewer collection rehabilitation replacement. This is just really a placeholder to show how much money we're um, programming into different, um, where we split it into the collection system and then into improvements for the um, wastewater facility. Through the mayor. Uh, ben, by any chance, are we, uh, our backyard lines that are not that great, are we uh, making future plans and budgeting to replace those lines, put them out in front of the houses instead of the backyard? Is that on our list by any chance? So this is where that million dollars, a portion of that money goes to. It goes into the, um, I believe it's the capital, we're calling it the capital fund. Okay. And so a portion of that money gets, it gets put in here into the capitalization fund and then also in the um, uh, recurring collection and rehabilitation system projects where we're stockpiling the money. I mean, every year we're doing a project and we're trying to, and what we've done with the collections team is we've identified um, priority spots for right. them. Yes. And the backyard mains off of, off of Queens, um, the north area up there have definitely been identified as in need just because of the, the original pipe type was the concrete and is just crumbling. And so that area is definitely on our hit list as we work towards getting it improved. Thank you, Ben. 
Okay, facility CIP. So um, this is a uh, this is one of um, one of my favorite CIPs because you really see um, parks and parks the, to the community, and, and then also you see the um, improvements to our facilities that affect staff. And so it's 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 a it's a funding source that really has some impact that people notice. Um, and so with that, I, I want to go into it eyes wide open on a lot of these projects. It's always difficult with the facilities projects because they're general fund funded. They're programmed with general fund dollars that are um, obviously limited as we work through this. And so you're not able to use utility dollars or road dollars. They're specifically from the general fund typically or limited resources. And then, and then when we've had these, um, they get programmed over multiple years for bigger projects. So, um, prices continue to increase and then there's always contingencies or, or for them because uh, people are always trying to get the best that they can for that for that project and so uh, right now this is how we have these pro projects program <coughs> but with that I want to make sure um, we're aware you know this is a budget amount we're still working through the design and going out to bid but most likely the the real number when they come in would be a little bit different and specifically for harder Parkway Park we had an $800,000 grant and so to maximize that grant, 50 cents on the dollar, it'd be best to put out a $1.6 million project. And then when you include contingency, project management, all of a sudden you're up around a $1.8 million project, and we've only got 1.538 programmed. So that's where you get into, um, Brad does a great job leveraging um, outside resources um, to bring in other funding sources, and then also um, finding that balance of, of what, we, um, what we build. So, so with that, um, the Harder Parkway Park, we're working through that, and Brad's working on the outreach and c confirming what's going to be in the park over the next six months or so, and then um, and then we'll go out, finalize the design, go out to bid, and then we'll have a hard number when we come back to, to <laughs> say, hey, this is what it's going to cost once we come back. With that, the Feather River Parkway Phase Two project, that's another uh, great project. It's kind of been on the books for five years or so. We've, we've, had the, we've, we've got the grant, but in order to get the permits from the uh, core and being within that river um, boundary, it's taken a long time to get the permits. And so we've recently just been approved and we're actually working to come back to uh, council June 18th to authorize um, the bid for that project. And so we'll have a, we, we think that number um, is good based on our current engineer's estimate, but we'll have a, we'll have more detail on that when we come back in here and, um, after we bid and come back in a couple months. Fire station number two, this is another big one. Um, right now, my understanding uh, from our project manager and working with fire that uh, they've been working on this remodel of uh, fire station number two to add a dorm and, and uh, dorm room and do an update from um, the facility that I believe was from Bill was built in 1978 and originally um, started operations in about 81. And, um, and so it's in need of a remodel. Um, staff's been working through it. Um, it never gets cheaper. They've tried to cut everything from the paint to ADA portions that they, they don't think um, might be necessary. And they've really got to a point where they have this project that we're thinking with the current bid environment is about 1.5. And so, um, the idea is that we're going to um, push really hard to cut everything out and work to embed it and tell, <coughs> tell um, you know, let bidders know that we got a tight budget and, and see what comes back. But um, this is one of those projects that they have pretty much shelf ready to um, put out the bid, um, but we're short, um, we're potentially short, and that doesn't include project management and contingency. Police department workstations. Um, this is a new for this year with, uh, it has to do with partitions in the detectives and, our, and the um, evidence room is my understanding. In the dispatch. dispatch, excuse me. So partitions in the dispatch and it has to do with um, evidence and different things that um, for, for privacy concerns of what's going on. And then uh, the, the miscellaneous improvements. <laughs> this is really the um, combination of both the $50,000 for city hall improvements that are annually budget and the $195,000 that was put in the budget for this year for um, improvements to buildings and grounds, which is uh, basically, there's 
certain items that we put, it's kind of a catch-all for problems that happen across the 17 different facilities from uh, roof leaks to um, um, uh, mildew damage on the eaves at the senior center to um, having leaks w within the um, fixing doors out front at City Hall for various, for various items. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Through the mayor? Yep. Um, ben, I, I appreciate how you have, um, I like your tables. Very easy to follow, so thank you for doing that. Um, the Feather River um, Parkway phase to work, can you tell me more about that? So it, it's a project, um, so, if, so Feather River Phase 1, so just north of the 10th Street Bridge. So if you come off the off-ramp, um, it's kind of a, a, a little bit of an awkward turn on Von Geldern mm -hmm. and then Su Sumner, where it pops up on the levee. Mm -hmm. And you, um, from the, from basically from the 10th Street Bridge north, it's, um, it's uh, Phase 1 of our park that was constructed approximately five years ago. I'm um, looking for Brad here. For well, he Diana. just stepped out. I'm, I'm sorry. trying to ex figure out when we did it, but it's been it's been in place for a little while. And so with phase two, that would be directly connected to that north end, and then run farther north from there. Here he is. Here's Brad. Right. From there to Pease, right? Oh, from there to Pease. Yeah. Okay. It involves uh, walking path, walking path, but. Um, uh, different pedestrian improvements. We're talking about um, the Feather River Parkway, Brad, and uh, they stumped me a little bit. I just looked at the plans, but there's there's a boardwalk that goes out to the river. There's um, a pedestrian paths and, and different paths uh, that are built out on the old city um, sewer system, the old sewer ponds that are out there that are all covered in brush. So it does a lot of clearing and grubbing and, and really cleaning up that so there's more paths. It also includes a bathroom Mm -hmm. and then a gazebo at the north end, mm -hmm. and then removing some of the berms uh, to provide more wetland drainage area, and then uh, picnic areas and informative signs so that people walking around can see um, the different wildlife and things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Through the mayor, I guess I, I'm going to ask an obvious question, given what's going on in the river bottoms right now and the, the volume of questions we get in regards to the sanitation and the debris and everything else. Um, how are we planning on addressing all that as this project continues to move forward? Councilman Boomgarden, uh, we've uh, had the Feather River Parkway project phase one. I don't know if, I apologize for missing part of the question, but I, um, so we've already put 1.4 million into that piece of property. Uh, we maintain that piece of property. There is staff down there every day. We have ordinances because it is a park uh, as far as any camping. Uh, we enforce that down there. Um, and uh, staff, uh, again, is, is we have eyes and ears down there every day. Um, one of the interesting uh, partnerships that we've had with uh, uh, the Sutter County um, one stop is that within four weeks after the high water event, there was some federal funding that came in and that the, they, we were asked if we wanted to participate um, with uh, acquiring people, uh, a work program that was created. And so for the last, I'm not exaggerating, for, since the high water event minus one or two months, we have had uh, six people and one supervisor down there. Um, uh, raising uh, what I call raising the skirt on the trees. Um, if you have not been down there in the last year, it looks tremendously different. Um, and so I say that because it is getting a lot of use. Um, in addition to once we are done with the um, approximately $1.7 million project, uh, you will start to see a lot of runs, uh, fun runs take place, community runs take place down there as well. Um, and I anticipate what will probably happen is that um, if uh, an organization wants to do a fun run, um, we're going to ask them that they do it down there. Um, and uh, the recreation staff will be putting on a fun run in the spring uh, to kind of show our community how it can be done. Um, but there's a lot of a variety of components, but to, uh, it's a long answer. But to answer, to answer your question, um, we have uh, very little problems down there because we are very active down there. 
Thanks. I, I guess the, my concern, and, and probably this goes to Chief Landon as well, uh, I know we made a deliberate effort not to put restroom facilities in, in city parks because that has a tendency to draw stuff that perhaps isn't the nicest for that neighborhood. We've put restroom facilities down here. It becomes public land. We can't move folks who have chosen to habitate down there off of public land because we don't have a temporary shelter yet. Um, what kind of burden is this going to place on on the police department to enforce this stuff? I, I, I would hate to put your folks in harm's way, but... Right. He we, wants you we, to answer. One, one of the I do. <laughs> one of the tools we have is the ordinance, you know, as it relates to parks. Um, and so all of our parks, everyone, everyone has to be out of our parks after the sun has gone down. Um, now, the enforcement part, I'll let the chief handle that one. I think raising the skirt and all the issues, there's a, there's a lot of cleanliness that goes there and increases the visibility where we can drive through there. The more accessibility for the patrol vehicles to get down there by doing the improvements here will allow us to be down there more frequently. But I think the biggest issue that we can address is the fact that it is a park. And as a park, we can, we can uh, control the hours where people can be there. So the camping ordinance, although it's not a no camping ordinance, there's no being in the park after dark and before sunlight or sunup. So it allows us uh, an ordinance to enforce. It allows us a mechanism to go down there and enforce it. Any other any other questions? I did get an answer to this uh, from an email I sent, but maybe a, a status on the Union Pacific Railroad property. Um, I know that there's a little bit of money put aside for this, but I mean, I, I happen to have some firsthand knowledge of this is a going nowhere thing, um, and it's general fund money. You know, I'll defer to Diana on that one <laughs> as she walks up. I, I know she uh, put, put the email response together yeah. and, and very knowledgeable on this long-standing project. So that is 19 years of my life <laughs> working with Union Pacific. Um, I wish I could say that we are further ahead than when we were then. I would say Union Pacific's further ahead in terms of identifying the contamination within the right-of-way. Um, so what that account pays for is we have an attorney that we utilize that checks in with Union Pacific maybe once every six months just to see the status of um, their interest in selling the right-of-way to the city at a reasonable price, recognizing that a considerable amount of Money's going to have to go into remediating it. Uh, Union Pacific has had a lot of different project managers. They have branches. The environmental branch doesn't necessarily talk to the right-of-way branch, so there's differing opinions in terms of what the property's worth. And so over the years, we've done um, different opinions of what the value is. We've coordinated with them in trying to encourage them to sell off pieces of it, um, particularly pieces that there are adjacent property owners that are interested in. And um, we've also encouraged them to work directly with those adjacent property owners to try to come up with a deal just to move it forward. We have not been successful in the negotiations and it continues to, um, to just kind of linger out there. We have been unsuccessful as well. Any more questions? Good. All right. Thank you very much, All right, Ben. Thank you. All right. Welcome. All right. So before I get started, I want to introduce somebody in the audience, and that is Phil Marler. Phil, if you could raise your hand. Mm. So Phil has been uh, he has been promoted to utility superintendent effective June eighth. <clears throat> And so um, he will be the person that's the mid-manager over the water treatment plant and the wastewater treatment facility. And he was previously the water distribution supervisor. So it's always great to promote from within. And I'm really looking forward to working with Phil in his new capacity as the utility superintendent. And I also wanted to note, he's on vacation this week and he came in specifically for this. 
So I'm very appreciative of that. Is he related to the famous Marler that used to work for the city? He is a direct descendant of okay. that famous Marler. <laughs> Hold that against him. Cousin, right, Phil? His cousin? All right, so what I'm going to present to you tonight is water and wastewater utility rates. So the purpose of rates is to ensure adequate revenues in the water and wastewater enterprise funds for operation and maintenance, debt service coverage, and capital projects. For background, in April of 2016, Council adopted the Water and Wastewater Rate Study. It proposed adjustments to the city's water and wastewater rates over the next five years, and it covers rates through fiscal year 2021. In June of that same year, Council adopted a Water and Wastewater Ordinance. One key thing noted in those ordinances is that it provides for Council review of the rates on an annual basis as part of the budgetary um, review process. So tonight at the budget workshop, we're presenting the rates with the intention of, in the past, it's been to have a July 1st implementation. That's something we can talk about tonight. And then also council set uh, by authority to be able to set rates by resolution. And then on January of this year, we had a water and wastewater workshop where we went over not only the rates, but connection fees and background in terms of the plants and condition. But at that workshop, council directed staff to present three options for, rate in, for rates for fiscal year 1920. One thing that I'd like to note is when you look at water conservation compared to 2013, um, what you can see on this slide, particularly, is something that we've all felt this last winter, <coughs> is that the winter of 1819 was really a wet winter. And so we have had significant conservation um, over these past few months. So you have March at 35.8%, April at 34.4%. Um, looking at February 2017, it was at 4.6%. This year is 20.7%. If you compare 2018 to 2017, you can see that 2018, for the most part, was significantly higher than the same month in 2017. So what does that do? Well, when you look at water sales, we had a council adopt a 10% rate increase last year. What we're really expecting to see is approximately 6.5% higher revenues as compared to last year for water sales. Large portion of that's due to the high amount of rainfall, so you saw people weren't you know, turning on the irrigation as uh, soon as they normally do or letting it go as long as they did last year. In terms of wastewater, a little bit different, expected to be approximately 6.1% higher as compared to an 8% rate increase. So we're not projecting to hit the mark in terms of where we thought with revenues, but it's still, um, still significantly higher than where we were last fiscal year. As a reminder for the water rate history, uh, this is just for a one inch meter. You can see that rate studies were adopted in 2011 and again in 2016. And so therefore you see, particularly this last rate study, dramatic increases in the rates. Large part of that is due to the drought and the uh, loss of revenues over that time period. And so we were um, trying to make up for lost time basically with this last rate study. <coughs> And then wastewater, very similarly, um, you see rate increases uh, that went into effect after rate studies were adopted in 2011 and 2016. So the three options that council directed staff to bring forward, option one was a zero increase, and that's what finance included in the budget, is that they didn't assume an increase was going to go forward. That way, um, the budget was based upon kind of you, you can either call it worst case or best case scenario, depending on who you are, but a 0% rate increase. Option two, and, and these don't have to be the same, you could do any menu of options here, but one was a 3.5% increase in water, a 4% increase in wastewater, and then also a 7% increase in water and 8% increase in wastewater. So how did we come up with 7% for water and 8% of wastewater? Last year, when we were looking at the rates, um, and we presented the rate increases to council, we were projecting for this fiscal year that we would need a 7% rate increase for water and an 8% rate increase for wastewater. And so therefore, earlier this year when we were doing the workshop, council said, okay, show us what that scenario looks like, but then also give us a couple other options. So we did the 0% and then the split. So the proposed water rates, so the current rate, uh, I'll just go over the one inch. 
is $35.84. So of course, a 0% increase is just <laughs> gonna match. And I really struggled with putting in a column for a 0% increase, but I wanted to be very clear that it really is a 0% increase. 3.5% increase would result in a rate of $37.09. A 7% increase would result in $38.35. And just to note, the amount approved through the Prop 218 process was $41.01. For wastewater, the current rate is $52.96 for a single family home. Zero percent increase would cause it to remain the same. Three and a half percent or four percent increase would be $55.08. An eight percent increase would be $57.20. And then the Prop 218 amount is $59.34. It should be noted that last year was the first year that council set wastewater rates below the approved 218 amount. Um, prior to that, they had been set at the 218 amount. And then for water is a little bit different. Previous year's council had set the rates below the 218 amount. And then proposed wastewater rates, this is for our industrial customers. If you recall, their bills are based upon volume, total suspended solids, and BOD. And so similarly, their rates would improve, increase based upon whatever council recommends. So just to provide a bill comparison for a one-inch water service, which is typical for a single family dwelling, under the current scenario for water and wastewater, if you uh, have an annual um, usage of about 15 HCF, if you recall one HCF is 748 gallons, your bill is $88.80. So when you get a bill today and you live in Yuba City, if you're an average water user, then you get a bill of $88.80. If you did a 3.5% increase of water, 4% increase of sewer, your bill would go up to $92.17. If you had a 7% increase in water or an 8% increase in sewer, your bill would go up to $95.55. If you were to increase the rates up to the uh, 218 approved amount, your bill would go up to $100.35. So there's a wide range there. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Mayor. Uh, you said ninety five dollars. It says ninety two seventeen on the four on the oh seven percent. I'm sorry. Never mind. I was looking for. I'm sorry. Jump down. It jumped down. Okay. So wide range in terms of options for council. I'm not looking for a recommendation tonight. Um, this is just something to consider, and I'll be coming back on uh, June eighteenth in terms of. Um, the direction that council wants to go. If if council wants to provide a direction tonight, that's great. I would just say that whatever is, if you chose to do zero increase or even to go with the three and a half percent increase in water, four percent increase in sewer, what it does is it takes away from funding projects. Because the bottom line, you still have to fund um, O and M operation and maintenance. You still have a defined amount for debt service. So what it really impacts is your ability to fund projects. With that said, we will be coming forward um, within the next. Rec we would recommend within the next year to update the rate studies. We finished the water master plan, and as I've told you before, the uh, cost of implementation of that plan is huge. And we're now doing the wastewater master plan. And so it's not a matter of, you know, um, you're not going to be able to fund all the projects. So it's a matter of um, the comfort level in terms of what she, council wants to move forward with. I would say that if you're looking for staff's recommendation, my recommendation would be at a minimum to do a three and a half percent increase on the water bill and a four percent increase on the sewer bill just to keep up with uh, CPI. Um, in terms of those costs that, you know, if you recall in terms of water and wastewater, salaries and benefits are on the uh, smaller portion of those costs. When it comes to O&M, it's more of the power and, um, you know, things that are more subject to CPI adjustments. And so staff's recommendation would be at a minimum due with the three and a half percent increase in water bill, four percent increase in sewer. Through the mayor. Diana, on the wastewater side, uh, the biosolids bio contract was brought up to us last council meeting. Uh, are those fees counting that in for paying the 
Would they be counting the cost, the additional costs that we're going to be getting here in the near future? These rates do not take into account uh, the anticipated increase for biosolid disposal. Um, just in running the numbers that they originally provided in their proposal, if I recall correctly, we'd be going from approximately 290000 to about half a million dollars. That's in year one. Um, you know, Recology has talked about perhaps a phased-in approach to get to market rate for the actual disposal cost. So I would expect in future years that cost is going to go up. So these current rates don't take that into account. Um, you know, when you're talking $210,000 roughly for, and it wouldn't be spread over the entire fiscal year. So for the fiscal year, it'd be a little bit less than that because it won't start until October 1st. Uh, your, your current revenues could address that, but you would not be able to um, withstand particularly any increases long-term without having significant impact on your revenues. Thank you, Diana. Through the mayor, do the Prop 218 limits, will that, um, if you add the biosolids, are those affected by the Prop 218 limits or is that a separate category? No, that is affected by, so the Prop 218 limits is the max you can charge for rates. Okay. So regardless of what you have going into that, whatever you're setting as your rates has to cover all of those costs, those operational costs. Thanks. And Diane, we don't really even have, uh, we have a ballpark of what may, uh, the biosolid contract or the, the fees may do to our rates. Any, any, any ballpark uh, number? Um. I don't have a ballpark number. Um, I, you know, it just if I were just to throw something out there, I would say it's going to be a few cents on a per customer basis. Right. Uh, you know, for year one, like I said, as future years <clears throat> as they're phasing it in and that cost increases, it'd be a little bit more. So, a few. So for a few cents, Prop Two Eighteen rates would anticipated to <clears throat> to cover the increase for now at least. The Prop 218 rates are significantly um, higher than, if we're going to look at sewer specifically. So the Prop 218 approved amount is $59.34 for a single family home. The current rate is $52.96. And so you have quite a bit of... Um, so we still have quite a bit of cushion. Yeah, you still have quite a bit of cushion there. That's what I need to know. Thank you. So one of the things that I would like to mention is that normally what we would do is bring the resolutions forward on June 4th so that we can have a July 1st implementation. Um, in working with our consultant who prepares our rate study updates, we have new people involved. And so they are still working on the rate models. Otherwise, I would have some other graphs to show you. And so that's why my proposal is to bring it back June 18th so I can show you specifically how it's going to impact revenues based upon uh, these different scenarios. So with that, I would not propose that we have a July 1st implementation because we would want to be able to give our customers advance notice that the rates are going to increase. So just to set expectations, I would come forward on June 18th with the additional um, fiscal information and then um, council could direct staff in terms of the which scenario you want to proceed forward with, and then we would come forward at a later date for adoption of the appropriate resolution and then setting the date that the rates would actually go into effect. That sounds reasonable to me. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. <coughs> All right. Now we're at the point of uh, public communication. Members of the public may address the council concerning any item that has been described in the notice of this meeting, if anybody would care to. All right. That being said, thank you very much, everybody, for all your hard work that, that resulted in tonight's presentation. We'll consider ourselves adjourned. <laughs>